means it's time to start to look towards the fourth and final series of our regional play. This is the last opportunity for NA to strut their stuff before we jump into the <laughs> international play tomorrow. And what a way to end the day as well. Hollywood Hammers going up against the Immortals, Greg. Yeah, this has been a, a brewing rivalry, to say the least. You know, a lot of these players have played with each other on previous teams. They've gone head-to-head -head a couple of times now, and it has always been extremely even. We had Hammers starting their comeback streak in the challengers against Immortals. Immortals then putting them down in the regular season when they met and so the you know the head-to-head -head series is tied against these with these two teams but not only that they met four months ago at the previous unified <laughs> live championship yeah i remember in I think. the first round <laughs> but even then it was three to two a full five game set so these two teams are just constantly mm -hmm. at each other's throats and neither one of them has been able to really take a clear advantage. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned London. I believe we, we have somewhat of an expert in that series <laughs> on the desk with us. What? Sweet Jay, Sweet Sweet Jay weren't, I don't know. weren't you there? Were, weren't you uh, was, was my twin brother, I think. Uh, oh, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, but yeah, definitely an interesting rivalry between these two teams. Let's start to take a look through these rosters. We'll start with Immortals on this one. This is a team that, as we mentioned at the very start of the day, came into the Vainglory with a huge cloud of hype around them. Yeah, and especially D'Enzio and Tigers, both exceptional players, especially in the live stage. They have this huge live buff that Zio just carries with him, but Tigers also. And now Maxwing, this is the second time on a live stage. So I felt like the nerves may be already figured out for him. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to see how they're going to perform uh, as a team on the live stage for the first time together as three. Yeah, one of the really exciting things about this team is all three of them are incredibly good mechanical players, but also they have two captains, including their sub, that are both at Vainglory 8 level. Like mm -hmm. both Excelsior yeah. and Max Green can step up to an international level. Yeah, and it's really impressive to watch them play. You know, they both played during the regular season. Mm -hmm. uh, Max Green was originally the starter. Yep. There were some internal issues with, amongst the team. He got benched for a, a week or two and then came back into the roster. And that was when they ended up winning the entire yep. week. So uh, incredibly strong stuff once they got themselves all back and gelled on the same Yeah, page. we also can't forget their coach, Hot Sauce. Probably the smartest analyst and probably one of the best, if not the best coach right now, I think, in the Vainglory 8. So stay tuned for what kind of drafts and stuff they come up with here. All right, well, he's got to be good to fill Sweejay's old shoes, but <laughs> it's time to talk about their opponents here. Hollywood Hammers coming on into this one. I mean, I mentioned it when I spoke about them right at the very start of the day. Hollywood Hammers feel like the ultimate montage reel team, right? When, when they win, they do it with absolute style. Yeah, I mean, we've seen starting all over pull off you know, one versus three triple kills. We've seen this team just make uh, these outstanding plays, you know, escape with a sliver of health, and then re-engage and make plays happen. It is so impressive to watch when they are able to perform at the best of their abilities. Not many teams can compete with them at that stage. Yeah, yeah. but and it's also Archaic and Afro's first time on the live stage. So nerves will probably have to settle in initially after game one or two. Um, but once they get like a really good composition, like heavy CC is what they prefer, they normally excel and they allow starting to then carry from the back line. Yeah, especially with Archaic there, I'm curious to see how, whether, whether stage jitters are going to affect that because, you know, Archaic was, I would say, one of the most improved players in North America across the course of this split. We, we went from this brand new player coming on in to, towards the end, being a revered and feared jungler in the North American scene. So curious to see how this squad does, but a very young squad across the board. So I'm curious to see you know, whether a lack of veteran is going to affect this, because yeah, that's something we've been talking about. And they also today. have a great support set. The Nami is kind of their coach right now, the filling coach, if, if people don't know. And also, Poli helps them a lot with the drafts and, and mental yeah, I was, part. I was going to say, we had mentioned, you know, the fact that there's two captains on the side of Immortals that are at the Vainglory 8, Vainglorious level. It's the same story for Hammers, with Poli being their substitute and their, uh, you know, helping out a lot with their drafts and helping to figure out the ways that they want to try and win the games. Yeah, for sure. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the histories within the Vainglory 8 here between the two teams, because these are two teams that across the course of this season, or especially across the course of the second split specifically, we start to see both of these teams. Uh, one of them qualified, one of them actually kind of woke up. Um, but they were still fairly inconsistent towards the end of the season. So it's like when they're winning, 
they are dominating, but it's not always there. What is it that separates their good games from bad games? Like, what is it that, that makes them inconsistent? How do they stop? How do they go from these, these losses, this is inconsistency, to being a dominant team? Yeah, I think it's the key to their rotations. It's, their, it's, their, it's the macro play, because both these teams have amazing mechanics and micro play, but it comes down to the macro, the strategy, and how they're playing. Because both these teams excel at early game um, rotations. They, they want to win the early game and then snowball it from there. And that's when they excel. Um, and sometimes when they play from behind, and both these teams actually can play really well from behind as well, they stay focused and they don't tilt as easily. All right, well, we'll see whether they can stay focused on the stage. The two players that I want you guys at home to be keeping your eyes on in this series are going to be Dienzio and starting all over. These two players, both incredibly young, but both superstar carries up in the lane. They're, they're both players that, when you look at these rosters, your eyes are immediately drawn to these two in particular, and both have had highlight moments already within the Bank Yeah, they're both incredibly well-known within the scene. If you've been following seen at all for any length of time you know both of these players they are absolute playmakers you can see their stats are incredibly similar within 50 on the, uh, the you know the 1270 versus the 1225 their KDAs are less than one apart from each other they're absolutely incredible players and Vox has been one of their go-to's for both of them that's gonna be hotly contested this series, D'Enzio this season, 6-0 and on Vox. Starting all over, 5-0 and on Vox. <laughs> Something is going to have to give. Yeah, for sure. And Vox has been a, quite a heavy priority across the course of this tournament so far, but also CP laners have been coming in. How do we, fare, how do we feel these two players are going to fare on the CP laners? Is this, this something that they have expertise in? Yeah, I mean, starting is known for a really solid Celeste. And Zeo, his scarf, probably the best in the world, is what he would like to say on Twitter and et cetera. I mean, both of them would. <laughs> you know, starting a little bit, I believe, had on his Twitter. Best and they Celeste. may still have it there. <laughs> best Celeste world, and that's a fact. So, you know, both of them definitely are going to be confident if they go into the CP laners. All right, well, we'll see how that's going to pan out as we oh, head on Lance into the draft. Comes out. Lance going to be removed. We've seen Lance a multitude of times today. Immortals not having any of it. Yeah, I think from here, Hammers will probably take away the Grace and deny really keys a captain, or they might just ban away to Idris, because Idris is so strong in this meta right now, and any team that basically gets Idris is able to... Oh, they're going to take away Cat, so that leaves Grace and Idris open on the side of Immortals here. Yeah, very interesting to leave the Idris available, uh, obviously prioritizing the Grace a little bit more than the Idris, maybe thinking that they can deal with the Idris if it comes through, but it will be the Grace that Immortals take off the board. So one of the first times we've seen Grace really prioritized here today, and it's coming in our final series of the day. Certainly is Grace, the first pick coming on through. And Immortals definitely a team that can use that aggressive play style that you can abuse on Grace. Hammers taking a bit of time to decide what they want to go with the first pick, and you can't blame them, really. This is There's a lot of Arden. pressure on this series, but Arden is going to be the pick. That's the second time we've seen Arden first picked on B-side. Yeah, that's a very interesting pick. Are they trying to do Arden Samuel here, uh, or I guess Arden with a strong um, laner that can die, maybe with Idris? So let's see what Immortals will take away and deny here. Are they going to go ahead and give the Idris over the hammers, or are they going to ban something that's different? Kesha will come out as a ban. Um, that's something that starting is plays Kestrel really well on is that weapon Kestrel so that may be a good band to to basically count to um they see target ban, <laughs> there we go, target ban starting all over here. Yeah, but now Hammers, they can pick up the Vox. They're gonna go for the Kroll instead. So wanting to deny that away from Immortals as well. Uh, T-Tigers has played a fair bit of Kroll in you know some of the, and towards the end of the season, and of course in the you know sort of mid-season events that go on outside of the Vainglory 8. Uh, so taking that away from him, but it's interesting that they didn't want to go for the box with the Grace on the other side. Yeah, Crow is really risky here because ha uh, Immortals has Grace, and Grace is a very good mm -hmm. counter to Crow as long as Max Queen times the Holy Nova and waits for Crow to dive. So honestly, a CP Idris would still be very strong in this composition because he can kite, he has Shroud Step, he can jump away from the Crow, Grace can then CC him. Um, so I think in terms of carry, CP Idris will still be good along with a like a grump jaw or something that can basically eat the crow and they can focus down on one of the other um, carries. Because pedal also would look good as well into the crow. So they can do maybe pedal with uh, a weapon powered laner. Yeah, it's great to see both of these teams 
you know, fully involved in the discussion on these picks. There's no, no one is being left out. All three members grouped up with their coach to go over these drafts to try and figure out what they feel oh, will be Adagio the most effective composition. And Adagio, double healing now for the side of Immortals. You have to figure this third pick is going to be some sort of bruiser. Curious to see how they will round this one out. Things like Glaive still available, but they go with a Black Feather in the end to round that one out. So likely going down into the jungle on that Black Feather. And Hammers now trying to decide what to go with alongside the Crow. Oh, it looks Celeste. like it's wow. going to be the Celeste coming on through here. That's a very interesting pick because Black Feather and Grace are pretty solid into a Celeste. Black Feather can Rose Offensive and dodge a lot of CC, the Core Collapse. And Grace can then also uh, give him the barrier. But so basically, th in this situation, if Hammer's able to protect starting, then Celeste can carry um, into the late game. But if Immortals can get onto starting and CC starting, then they're gonna have an easier time winning these team fights. Well, we already talked about how starting is a fairly confident Celeste <laughs> player coming on into this. And we'll see whether it's gonna be enough. These two teams are absolute rivals and it's gonna be starting off our last series of today. It's time to head over to our casters and kick off this final game. Hey guys, it's me, Jaws and it's Scoundrel. They are right, last series of the day, last best of five, Hammers and Immortals. This is gonna be a rematch of the London Live Championships. They went to a very close 3-2 to Immortals. I'm sure Hammers won their revenge. Yeah, this was an absolute cracker at the last <laughs> Unified Live Championships. It's gonna be the same today. Two incredibly closely matched teams. Both teams are considered way above their seeding in terms of their potential here at the Unified Lives. Immortals even being considered a dark horse to win the whole thing. I think the Des did a really good job of analyzing the two key players here, Dienzio and starting all over. Last year, Dienzio considered the young rising star of Vainglory. This year, starting all over holds that title himself. But both of them, as the stats say, are equally as good as each other. And starting was probably one of the only members that kept Hammers in it in the last finals. Can he do the same today? That is such a scary prospect, isn't it, for Dienzio going up against the brand new rising star, the guy that's technically replacing him, well, that title at least. It's going to be a pretty tough one. I think this is going to go to game five. Let's not, let's not beat around the bush here. It's going to be a close one. But these compositions, a little bit odd coming out of the gate. You said maybe we'd see something like an Idris and the Death Touch on it as well. Yeah. Not the case. Well, I, I was talking to a lot to the, uh, some of the top North American teams, and they were saying Idris Cruel, incredibly strong. You stick it with something like a Grace or a Catherine. That's like a perfect composition in their eyes. Very interesting that there's very limited ways to protect the Celeste bar, the Vanguard, and the Gauntlet. And, you know, Blackfeather and, and Grace, they can dive really hard. They have two ways of delivering the Gift of Fire. And the fact that Agent of Wrath amplifies weapon power Blackfeather's executing potential on the Celeste. I do really like what our monsters have brought to the table here. Well, the Celeste does need to get going. That is going to be the first port of call. Let's touch on this Crawl pick in the jungle. How's it going to really match up against T-Tigers on this Black Feather? We know the North American teams, they're so aggressive in their early rotations. I actually always favor Cruel in this matchup uh, early on because if you can basically get those stacks down onto the Black Feather, he really relies on getting someone lower. Wait a second. Oh, speaking of stacks, the NZO going a little bit low. Arcade chasing him off, starting all over. He's burning alive just a little bit, but Arcade is now surrounded, but he is going to manage to get out. Not too much of an issue. Immortals just uh, up on that trade of DNZO's healing. So Weapon Power Black Feather specifically does take a little bit of time to get rolling. Early in the jungle, he often relies on getting that uh, damage down, looking for the executing blows with his uh, feint. But Cruel, obviously, with those weakness stacks, they're going to limit his potential to burst someone down. You limit his executing potential, you limit his ability to take you down to a lower HP. So I do like Cruel early on if Archaic can be aggressive. But uh, as soon as T-Tiger starts to get rolling, Starting alone, I have to be very careful, but we've talked about the one member of Hammers that needs to perform for Hammers to do well, that is starting, and he's on a carry that has shown incredible success at the Unified Lives already. Celeste in the late game can single-handedly dismantle compositions, so if this goes later on, if they can peel for starting, if they can keep him alive in these team fights, if they can prevent that gap closing, getting the work done for Immortals, Hammers have got a good shot. Yeah, we've already seen the surprise attack solar flare from down towards your base, all up to all up towards your lane. A big way, a little bit of a shocker if you're just hit by a, almost a 500 stack out of damage. Mm. But now hammers, they are securing this lane of priority. Obviously, jungle will intensify very, very soon. 
But Archaic right now, not feeding T-Tigers on this farm. The farm game definitely in T-Tigers' favor. Yeah, he's just shoveling that farm down, wants to hit those spikes as quickly as possible, working towards... I mean, there's several things that the uh, Black Feather can go these days. With the six sins, you would imagine he'll work towards a Sorrow Blade early on, gives him a good amount of uh, burst damage. In the mid game, will be very powerful. And I think that's where Immortals are looking to have their majority of impact. They've got an incredibly good mid game composition, which will scale quite nicely into the late game with the Grace when she gets the Echo. But if they can snowball from the mid game, where they're going to have the spike of the alternating current, maybe get the Sorrow Blade on T Tigers, that would be looking to put pressure on before starting hits level seven. Just looking to pressure this Celeste before she gets out of control. Maybe out of control. She's not quite there yet. Core Collapse is going to land. Here comes the Crawl as well. Dientio takes a whole load of damage, but beautiful Holy Nova from Max Green. Gets the triple knock up. Archaic taking a lot of damage, actually. Just wanted a little bit too far into turret range. And one of the other things is that if this gets to the late game, Immortals always have that ability to consistently uh, reduce damage onto T-Tiger specifically. You know, you've got the double heal coming out from the Grace. You've got the Gift of Fire as well. You know, Celeste is a very burst. Wait a second. Oh, another Holy Nova does end up landing on starting. He's going very low. He's actually just going to get cut down. That fire from Dienzio is going to find secure first blood. Immortals have already won on the board. Hammers, they need to respond. Again, this is looking to put pressure on starting before things get rolling. There's so many ways to focus him down. Gifted Fire slows that target down, meaning Holy Nova is a lot easier for Max Green to land as well, even in an offensive capability. And Immortal is starting to turn the screw on Hammers here in the very starting uh, opening moments of this game. A really important series for both teams and two incredibly strong North American teams themselves. And the winner of this, like we said, could be a real dark horse to go far in this composition. Playboy Afro and Arcade, this is their first time on the stage as well. And you've got to think that's going to lead them to maybe have a little bit of nerves. I mean, it's always a big thing to talk about and touch on, the fact that, you know, live buff like Immortals get, this could work in favor for them with Archaic and Playboy Afro not having that kind of experience. We know Dienzio just gets this massive buff, and it seems like he's got a damage buff half the games, in all honesty, uh, when he comes into actually live performances. Beautiful core collapse, by the way, to stop the advances of Immortals. My one worry for, for Hammers is we talked about how n sort of necessary it's going to be to peel for starting in the late game. There isn't that much that does it, you know, you get a Crucible down, suddenly things like the Cruel Ultimate doesn't become that much of an issue. Um, only thing that Arden provides is that Gauntlet, he'll need an Echo to provide the real uh, high level peel that is required for starting. And, you, and you've got so many ways to keep the threat sustained and ready on starting. You've got, the, like I said, the double heal from Max Green once he gets his own Echo, Dienzio's Gift of Fire, which is going to slow starting all over as well, meaning T-Tigers is going to find that position to take him down more readily. You can keep a sustained assault oh, on the starting, starting so easily. Over, yeah. Look at that damage. Max Green goes straight underneath the turret as well, but that heal does come out from the fountain. Nice double knock up as well from the Holy Nova. Archaic's going to fall first. Are they going to keep chasing here? Dienzio with the kill, second on the board. Starting all over in a lot of trouble. Has to back off away from his turret. Immortals, they've got him surrounded now. Playboy Afro trying to support, but I'm not sure it's going to be enough. Dienzio with his third kill. That damage buff that I was talking about is really coming online now. I think Immortals did a really, really good job here of just playing around the item spikes, nearly at that Sorrow Blade for T-Tiger. The NCO picking up the alternating current, the first major item for the CP Adagio in lane. They are looking to punish this mid game. This is the point in the game where Celeste is probably at her weakest. She's had to go for the Eve of Harvest because starting all over realizes that he's not really there for damage right now. The main job for him is to sustain, spam those Heliogenesis to try and clear the waves and just try and get as much health back in these team fights as possible. He's not playing for this portion of the game. This is why he's gone Eve of Harvest first. You very rarely see this unless you're looking to say, I'm writing off the next couple of minutes of this game. I'm waiting to the late game to have my impact. And that's what starting appears to have done with this particular build. Just wants to be able to clear waves, sustain, and survive. Well, speaking about items, Archaic, he's picked up that tension bow, but he needs this poison ship online as well. The amount of healing that the mortals do have in their kit, especially later on, it's going to be such a pain to deal with. The tension bows, well, wait a second. Oh, I don't know. No, Archaic's good. Tension bow is a really interesting item on this current update is not quite as strong as it was previously. It did receive that 2% nerf. And I always think that Tenshibo is an item that you need to play around very specifically. Like, it is a very powerful item spike if you manage to get it very early on. I, 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 my only thing is that this is, he's almost building burst-orientated against a Grace 
and against uh, Dienzio, I would have been saying Poison Shiv. Like, Poison Shiv is almost feels like it's necessary in this game. Yet you've gone for the tension bow. You're looking to burst sp specifically. And the longer this goes against a Grace, that's harder to do. Oh, nice Holy Nova. Again, another double knock up. It will be the gauntlet laid down as well. Versus Justice is going to come through. Dienzio completely left protected. But that massive heal from Max Green is going to make sure Dienzio survives the fight. Another kill 4 0 for the Adagio. A beautiful double core collapse from starting is all he can hope for at the moment. That was a static uh, Adagio. Brilliant ultimate from Dienzio as well. But it just. Just so hard to punish him because of the serious lack of damage. I think, like I said with the tension bow, it needs to be played upon at, you know, four to six minutes. When you pick it up first, you look to jump in, make bursts happen in the early game when the health is low and that massive on-hit damage has an impact. At this point in the game, doesn't feel like it's going to work as effectively. You know, Poison Shiv against almost basically a double heal feels like it should be coming through. I imagine that's what he's going to build towards now, but let's praise Immortals for how they played this. They knew where their major advantage was. They had been playing around that point in the game so well. They've been playing around item spikes so well, and now that we've got that Sorrow Blade, the, the, um, a bit of defense coming out onto T-Tigers as well, they're going to look to push this as hard as they can. Echo on its way for Max Green as well. You imagine when that comes through, that is where team fight dominance is going to start to shine for Immortals. You just saw the stat pop up on your screen as well. Almost 70% first turret take for Immortals. That's massive. That's one of the biggest I've seen in the league thus far. This is going to be a real backwater right now for Hammers. This, they need to be able to pick something up here. They got Von Hell's Heart. Solar Storm almost kills the Gold Miner. But that would be a immense gold pale for Immortals right now. 3,000 in the gold in the, in the bank for them at the moment in nine minutes. It's looking all too good for them. Live buff really coming up strong. Yeah, Immortals always perform well at lives, and they've shown that in the past. They're showing it here. You mentioned that first turret statistic. It's something that North American teams shine at doing. They are so good at early, aggressive, objective-focused gameplay. They always have an objective in mind when making plays, and they always seem to get that first turret, which opens up the rest of the map to allow them to continue their aggression into the mid-game. Immortals do that so well, and most North American teams do, and it's often why they are considered to have the advantage over the slow-paced European teams, because North America, they are unrelenting. Unrelenting in, in always doing something. No, they, don't, they very rarely just say, oh, we're going to farm. It's, it's always an end goal in mind for North American teams, and, you know, Immortals are one of the sort of the stalwarts of, of proving defeated. how effective that is. Well, speaking of objectives, Immortals take another one off the map. That Crystal Century will go down. Two lives remaining for that one, and complete domination from them. Even the vision in their favor. They're just making mean work of Hammer's Jungle as well. And by taking that Crystal Sentry, it literally illustrates the point that I was just making. You don't see too many teams, especially over on the European side of the map, uh, on the European side of the world, uh, European side of the map, European side of the world, go for something like that. They, you know, Immortals take objectives. They take things. Not, it's, it's very similar to what North American teams do. And actually, I think that the Crystal Sentry, wait a second. Well, Max Green going in, doesn't quite find the Holy Nova. Core Collapse is going to get blocked by Dienzio. Perfect reflex block. And Hammers, they do have that corner available. They got From Hell's Heart as well. We haven't actually seen that activated yet by RK. I like that starting all over has just accelerated his build here. The farm is coming in quite well for him. He's kept up with Dienzio on farm. He's almost equal. That's incredibly impressive from this guy. He's going to accelerate towards that three item build, which is the spike for the Celeste. She is now post level seven, or no, post level eight rather. So she's got that extended range on the Heliogenesis. I kept saying level seven earlier, I didn't mean to. Oh, Archaic has found T Tigers, but Max Green's found the rest of the team. Hello, Playboy Afro going in once again. Still Gauntlet available. Max Green, though, does have the Echo online now as well. So two of those Divine Interventions can come out in one team fight. This is going to be uh, very tough for Hammers. No Poison Shift still on the side of Archaic. So he's going to really just have to rely on that heavy burst damage starting all over. He's going to be providing the majority of this damage with his broken myth stacking up in this team fight as well. The problem is that if Cruel prioritized offensive itemization here, he's going to get shredded by this Immortals roster. So he needs to pick up these defensive items. But like you said, it delays that very important item of the Poison Ship, which realistically with a burst composition, what you want to be able to do, and, and they are sort of, the way that they built is, is alluding to kind of bursting a target down. Celeste is very burst heavy, as is with the Tension Bow Cruel. And obviously you have the Spectral Smite, which acts as a burst as well. Reducing healing feels like that's probably going to be one of the most important factors of trying to get through one of these carries on Immortals. One thing that the Hammers roster does have going in their favor, though, is if they can rebut that initial engage from Immortals, they have incredible counter engage, incredible chase down as well. Starting all over, if he manages to survive that initial, you know, foray from Immortals, 
he can run them down with the heliogenesis spam so keep an eye on how hammers play if they get away in the early engages from immortals that flurry of heliogenesis is exactly what's happening right now t tiger's taking a fair bit the nta is forced to back off but he does have the heals in his kit so again this is going to be the the main kind of tipping point here can hammers actually chunk down immortals enough for them to Warren actually backing off. Crystal Sentry is going to be the next on the board. There comes the Gauntlet. It's going to lock three members in. The NDO caught on the sidelines, but it's not going to matter. Divine Enchanted goes straight down on Steve Duggan. Kept alive in this fight. Starting all over is going to be the target. He will end up going down after this first. Finally kills him. They trade one for one, though. Nice double knock-up coming through from Max Green. Holy Lever strikes true. DNZO trying to kite back. RK still chasing him forward, though. That smite stacks are building up. He can just rend him away, but DNZO just a little bit too quick, burning them alive. Max Green trying to keep them off him, but DNZO so low, still oh. trying to kite. Double knock-up. Immortals fighting back. DNZO finds himself his sixth kill. Playboy Afro running with his tail between his legs. This could be an ace here. Hammer's getting chased down by Immortals. Here we go. There's... Oh, no. Starting all over. Just came back online. So wasn't going to get the ace buff. But enough to put a bit of pressure on the map here. Dienzi are going to start to clear wave. Starting all over. Starting all over really wants this. But Divine Intervention will heal him up. Uh, about 500 HP. So he's not going to be too bad. Benediction comes through. And starting all over now. Has to just farm on this wave. Just make sure they can clear it. Waiting for Arcade to get back in lane. Going hard on this uh, aggressive move onto the turret here. They really are starting all over. Dropping the core collapse on himself. Will be able to kite away, but T Tiger's dashing under the turret. Rose defensive. Benediction comes through. Holy no, it doesn't quite find Archaic before he takes down T Tigers. Playboy Afro is in the mix. DNZO being that man of the hour is still trying to run away from Archaic. He's done it once. Can he do it again? Archaic doesn't have From Hell's Heart and no big cooldowns are available, so they will end up backing off. Wow. Max Green showing exactly what Sweet J was talking about on the Analyst deck, the ability to completely shut that initial move down from Cruel. Cruel is someone who really relies on just simple movement speed mobility. He is all about moving across the map, no fancy gap closes. If you can shut that down, if you can stop him from doing that, it kind of shuts Cruel down in general. Cruel needs to make that initial attack onto a target to stick to them really easily, build the weakness stacks, look for the potential for a, a Spectral Smite execute. If you can stop him from getting to the target in the first place, that kind of shuts Cruel down incredibly quickly. So that's exactly what um, Sweet J was talking about on the desk and how, I mean, Max Green's been playing this so well. Every single time, able to keep D'Enzio alive and keeping D'Enzio alive against the Cruel is very important. An addiction's gonna slow up, starting all over, still trying to kite back, can't really put anything down right now. We just cannot get away from T Tigers. Gorn is gonna come through, he's gonna get stunned up with the benediction, is gonna help it. Then oh, starting all over with a massive ultimate. solar storm, with that massive elbow from DNZO, he's just gonna execute one. But he is gonna have to run away right now. Max Green does get the double knock up, but he does end up going down, starting all over now, starting to come online. Oh, DNZO with the kill though, one v 3 maybe he could do it, starting all over, very low energy, has to back off underneath his turret. Playboy Afro still wants a piece, however. Playboy Afro Taking too many kills, double kill, nine kills on the board, 2v1. So close for Hammers finding the way back. And let's take a look at this again. So what actually happened here was that peeling that starting all over needed worked out really well for him. The Gauntlet was so nicely placed. It kept Blackfeather locked in place for a moment, allowing starting all over to position his ultimate to get the maximum impact. Massive health regeneration from the Eve of Harvest. He managed to position at the backside of the fight. And once Blackfeather goes down, there's very little way to threaten the Celeste. But let's take a look at DNZO here. Kiting, dodging, knew that starting all over didn't have the energy to consistently spam the heliogenesis, knew that he was safe to take this on, and even with double the kill. Atlas Pauldrons coming through, with a bit of help from the turret, it managed to get a double kill back in Immortals' favor. The live buff is just too good. Kraken is going to fall as well, you can imagine, but Playboy Afro kind of wants to intervene. He needs to at this point. Look at the gold lead, 5,000 at 16 minutes. Not what you want to see if your hammers. They need to intervene, they need to do it right now. So Storm's gonna come out, he's gonna oh, get he stolen. stolen Playboy Afro just basic attacked it, I believe. Steals away the Kraken, Immortals now gonna have to chunk out as much as they can. Hammers, they're still on the pursuit. They've got the Kraken on the board and it's gonna start to march down that lane. Frostburn into effect now for starting all over, gonna give him the ability to peel and chase down targets really nicely. Immortals took a risky move there. It is always incredibly risky to go for a Kraken in a three versus three situation. Here we go. Benediction, War Treads, Holy Nova onto the bat line. Playboy Afro going low, Gauntlet comes down, but they're all trapped inside there with Immortals. First of Judgment doesn't come through, but the heal does come on straight to DNCO. Playboy Afro is gonna fall. DNCO, he's got double figure kills. Starting all over, can't do much. 
That'll be a kill for T-Tigers going extremely low. Archaic just cannot find the last hit. Immortals, oh. no! Archaic finally finds the kill onto T-Tigers. They do end up clearing ace. him up. A nightmare to put it in plain words. Immortals with the ace. They're going to take the turret, but have to deal with that Kraken as well. That is the dive onto Celeste that we were talking about. The ability to consistently stick to her like glue, and that's what a Black Weather can do. Well-timed Rose Offensives get through the core collapse. Well-timed Rose Offensives get through gauntlet walls. And you're seeing how much of an effect it is when you can just stay on top of a Celeste. You don't allow her to position those Heliogenesis effectively. You don't allow her to find the prime opportunity to channel her ultimate because she remains static during that, that, uh, that animation. So if you just channel your ultimate randomly, especially when you've already got a lot of those heart drop stacks built up on top of you, you are asking to get executed. So starting all over when it's consistently fought from the back foot in very intense and close fought situations, that's what Immortals are searching for. What Hammers need to do is when this Echo comes out, I think that'll be a big, big move for them. They'll have the ability to double Gauntlet. It'll be a lot harder to negotiate the terrain for Immortals. So wait for that item spike to come out for Playboy. This is not over yet. The scoreline definitely suggests a game going well in favor of Immortals here, but there is still big item spikes to come. Clockwork out and starting all over as well. That's pretty big for him too. Slumbering Hust actually picked up here for T-Tigers as well. Just wants to survive. He knows Dienzio can do a majority of this damage. Look at his items right now. Four complete... Well, actually, scrap that. Six completed items for Dienzio with the infusion online as well. You look at his counterpart in starting all over. Clockwork finished, yes. He's only one tier three item behind in the boots, but he's not nearly outputting as n close damage as Dienzio is. Hammers have to be careful here. If they make the engage, they're doing the work for Immortals. Well, I don't know. Max Green wants to say something here. Playboy Afro jumps straight on top of Dienzio. Nice, beautiful block on the core collapse there. Archaic in the back line, trying to get those Mortal Wound stacks on, but Dienzio left completely alone. First judgment, that's a lot of damage, but starting all over with those Helio Genesis. It's just trying to find and look for Dienzio. That's the goal to heal him up. Benediction comes through as well, just to try and kite away. But Dienzio, can he turn this one around? He's found one, but Archaic just tears him down. And Max Green now on the run. Playboy Afro and Archaic. Last members alive for Hollywood Hammers. Will they be able to find the ace? I think so. Eventually, when they tear him down, but Benediction is going to keep him alive for a moment longer. Very fancy feet on Max Green. Ace. Does end up falling. Ace for Hammers. Still, turrets. Not a priority here for Hammers. But the Kraken will be. Let's take a look at that replay again. Specifically, look at the positioning of T-Tigers here. Cut off from his primary target, he gets locked into a duel with Archaic. The Rose Offensive puts him right into defensive areas with Dienzio. He's right next to Dienzio there. That's not where he wants to be in these fights. He is being forced out of the way by the Cruel here. What he maybe should have done was turn round and Rose Defensive directly towards starting and tried to pressure him. That meant Dienzio would have been freed up to try and duel the Cruel and the Ardim. The problem that he had there is he rose offensive into a defensive position. If you're doing that as Immortals, you're going to lose. T-Tigers looking to stop this Kraken. That smite will come through in a second from Hell's Heart. Is going to be able to help secure it. T-Tigers gets stunned up. He uses the rose offensive to get away. Second Kraken now on the board for Hammers. They're really starting to pile on this pressure. Starting all over. This guy is coming online. Interesting that uh, I would maybe... T-Tag has gone for the Slumbering Husk because the burst from Celeste is his primary focus. He's not actually that worried about Archaic. Archaic, Archaic for the most part, is probably going to spend his time trying to threaten Dienzio. So he's, he's not even worried by building armor because it's actually the least of his priorities in terms of damage reduction. But maybe the... Wait a second. Archaic on the sidelines still wants to try and go for something here. That's going to be a goal that comes down, but they're trying to just get on T-Tigers. But that, maybe that's not the target you're looking for. Dienzio with the free hitting damage. T-Tigers jumps on the back line. Oh, oh, it's going to fall. T-Tigers just cuts him up. Uh, there will be a turret falling though for Hammers. The Duendio trading a one for one. That's going to be a nice block. And Duendio still quite back. Arcade didn't really stand a chance here. They need to go back to base though, because Kraken is now knocking on their doors. Playboy Afro does manage to get the stop on Duendio, and now it is only the Grace to deal with that Kraken. Duendio is going to chase him down. Playboy Afro, you know, just going back to base at this point. And Ace, the buff is there, but they might just still lose another turret. They're definitely going to lose at least one here. They'll have to be very careful that they don't lose two. Two Krakens have been doing some serious work for Hammers, and now with just one Vein Crystal turret remaining, Immortals are going to have to be very careful about how they approach these next team fights. Positioning is going to become that much more important now, Jaws. One wrong foot, and Hammers will sweep this game away from you. Immortals have been on top from the very get-go, but Hammers still able to cling on here with some good neutral objective takes.
It's 22 minutes in, 17 to 9 on the leaderboard right now. Or on the scoreboard, I should say. Immortals and Hammers, this was going to be a close game. And Immortals, they just take fight after fight after fight. And you can see just by their like their KDAs right now, DNCO is 14 and 1. But the problem is Hammers, they just have beautiful neutral objective control. Absolutely, that's been what's keeping them in the game. This troll is Kraken and the Kraken take just there. The two things that have kept Hammers fighting in this late game. You can see every time Immortals execute the fight the way they want to, they dive T-Tigers in, they find the initial pressure onto starting, Dienzio becomes less threatened, the fights become much more aggressive and fast-paced, meaning it's harder for Celeste to position her abilities. That's Immortals, what they want in their favor. If they don't find that or they get split up, that's where things are going to start to come awry. Hammers want a dis disorganized Immortals. Hammers want a split up Immortals. They want starting to feel less threatened. They want to be able to get starting out of the initial area of the fight and then allow him to reset with positioning on Heliogenesis, find a good ultimate to regen. Here we go again. Max Green going in, War Treads is pop, starting all over, trying to kite back, but look at those hard cross snaps. No, he's dead. Dientio just cuts him up. There's the corner, does come through the. Oh, that was almost an execute on up to RK, but it's not going to matter. A double kill for Dientio. Make that 16 now. Playboy Afro had to just get that recall off, and now Hammers, they're going to have to defend their base, but Immortals, they're looking for more. So they've got three Vein Crystals turrets to go through. I reckon they can take one and go to Kraken immediately and set up. Nice gauntlet, though, to try and prevent them moving in to take this, but they're going to jump in oh. straight away. Little bit of beat him there with the little emotes, but it's going to get taken out, no problem. Immortals, like you said, maybe looking to go towards this Kraken now. Death timers are starting all over an archaic are pretty high. Need to make a more decisive decision. Wasting yeah, a little bit of time it. there. Yeah, they wasted a little couple of seconds. That might come back to bite them, but with 50 seconds on the gauntlet, this should be a pretty good time for Immortals to say, okay, we can take this for free, set up to end the game off the, uh, off the back of that. So they're going to take it slow. They're going to move around. This does open up to another steal here, and a steal would be catastrophic for Immortals. Either they set up for another team fight, or they straight up try and burst this Kraken. Maybe you're right, maybe they were a little bit too late on that rotation, or they might just try and bait them in here. Max Green is going to walk into them. Now, Flair is going to spot the entirety of Hammers. Now, starting all over, he's got massive crack and stealing potential with that Solar Storm, plus uh, uh, Smite as well. I, I, I love this move from Hammers. They're actually just going to move into the Kraken area. Oh, no, they're not. They're going to move towards the base. Starting all over, maybe looking to that back door. That scout trap is MVP. Now they're trying to get these oh. recalls off. DMCO gets stopped. Archaic's job has been completed, but back at the base, Max Green What's trying to do something. Starting all over, starting all over. he's trying to take the turret, but the shield just keeps regening. Max Green trying to take him out. He dives, he's got the recall off as well. Does end up killing him, but now DMCO might just get traded for it. He still managed to take that turret. Is the healing enough? I don't think it is. Archaic ends up getting the kill, gets the shutdown. They end up trading one for one, but Hammers come up with a turret. There's only the crystal left. What a move there. Immortals Tigers coming through. Playboy Afro gets away. A game of inches right now, but an open vein crystal for Immortals. And the trade onto Dienzio was so important. It levels the playing field. And no one's going to get anything big on the map right now. But now you have to be super aware of even just the vision on the map. It's going to have to be filled with scout traps around this um, immortal space. The only thing that they have going in their favor there is there's no significant damage threats that can cross the wall easily. So it has to run through the choke point area of the base. Easier to control vision that way. But Immortals will be looking to search for fights. They won't even want to run that risk. They're going to be looking to fight as much as possible in a 3v3 setting to secure this game. That's where their advantages have been in the late game. The ability to just chase down that Celeste, keep your eyes on her. If Immortals get lost in sort of some sort of weird, complex uh, crack and play, and then they get backdoored, they will feel really hard done by at the end of this. Speaking of chasing down, an itemization choice we don't normally see. Triple war treads for Immortals. So you can see exactly where they want to lay the punishment on. Speaking of punishment, there's one set of war treads used. Gordon is going to come down. No, if it was actually really big there. The Gordon is going to separate them, but a beautiful Heliogenesis is going to go off. Dienzio managed to find one kill. Versus Judging comes through. Massive double stun. Archaic's going to fall as well. Playboy Afro, last member alive. That'll be Dienzio's 18th kill. The ace, the base. There's only two turrets standing between them and the first game of the series. Immortals have played this so well. That last fight, 
Starting was asking to get Stop. killed with this positioning. This is just done, Jaws. Immortals are going to run these main crystal turrets down. They're going to take the first game of this series. It was going to be close to the bloodbath. It was as well. 23 to 10. Immortals with the first check mark on the boards. Hammers, they need to come up with something in game number two because Dienzio was actually fire. Playing one of his best heroes as well. He's one of the few laners in North America that can pull off that Adagio himself or old school. Have been known for it over the years. But the composition was so good into Celeste and starting's positioning right at the end there, taking an aggressive move. He was asking to get engaged on and Immortals gladly dealt the killing blow. They found that 3v3 fight that they needed to and that got them the win. I just can't believe what I saw in all honesty. That 2v1 by Dienzio as well. And Bahamas have beautiful neutral objective control. This is this is gonna come down to the wire, I think, every single one of these games. But we got Munchables and the rest of the guys over on the desk to break that game down even further. I mean, we've had some back and forth games across the course of today. <laughs> and this, it's already topped them all. We're only in game one of this series and already it has been absolutely incredible from both sides as well. But if we start at the very beginning of the game, Immortals, they began on a roll. They began so strong. Yeah, through the first few minutes of this game, it was looking like it was just gonna be a really quick 3-0 series because Immortals were so strong right off the bat. Came out of the gate firing. Dienzio got an insane, KDA. an insane KDA. He was 11 and 0 at one point. When he was finally shut down, it was almost a thousand gold that Archaic got for that one kill. It was absolutely insane. Yeah, yeah, and the early game by Immortals is so well. Like they're they have such good target focus. And look at look at they kite Archaic here. The out comes off. Zio barely survives that. And then they were able to kill uh, Archaic. So really good play by IMT in general. They're able to take two gold mines, they focus on sentry, but I wish they focus on the objectives a little more because hammers, once they got into the late game, mm -hmm. they start making some huge comebacks. And that is the scary thing about this Celeste. If you can get to the late game, the damage you deal. And I mean starting. Definitely made a run for it later in this game. This was such good team play. Max Green deserves a yeah, massive. Max. Like, you, he should get about five assists for these couple for this <laughs> kill because he kept Archaic off of DNZ that entire time. Between the Frostburn and the slows coming out from the grace, it was, that was the only reason why Dienzio didn't end up yeah. going down in that My situation. My notes here, like three times, Max Green playing solo, landing his Holy Nova, lands his Holy Nova, lands his Holy Nova. <laughs> I mean, amazing play by Max Green. And his echoes were great too. Yeah. And I thought that, you know, one thing they could have done differently though is they didn't need to focus Afro. He had echo. The downfall of echo is you don't have that much defense. If you look at the defense, Arden was actually the squishiest, and he was always out of position with the gauntlet. They, just, they should just focus Arden and kill him, and then go for Crow or Celeste. They overly dived Celeste a few times, and the Echo gauntlet would then CC them, and then they lost some key fights. So I felt like they could have done their strategy a little differently, but in the end, it worked out. Once Tigers had Slumbering Husk, and the poison ship was huge, yeah. I thought that turned it around because that basically nerfed the barriers and all the protection that starting needed. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, let's take a look at a moment that happened later on in the game. It was starting all over, trying to make things happen with his team. And this was so close to paying off right here. Yeah, he's able to get Wonder. They stop the recall of Dienzio and just delay the recall on uh, on T-Tigers. And with just the captain there, not enough damage to prevent him from being able to take down that turret. But once T-Tigers got back, they were able to take the kill. But because they had prevented Dienzio from being able to recall, they were able to 2v1 him down and make sure it was a trade. So that even though they lost their carry in that backdoor attempt, they don't actually lose much off the map because they traded carries and in beautiful the reflex block there by Tigers and just going through that gauntlet. And you can see starting, starting has zero defense against Black Feather. So any type of damage that Black Feather gets on him, it's gonna pretty much pass through. And Celeste is just way too squishy against the Black Feather. So I felt like the four atom build was mm -hmm. kind of risky in this situation. Yeah, and some excellent team fighting at the end there from Immortals. Final scoreline of 18 2 and 4 on Dienzio. That is yeah, just he ridiculous. Just played, outplayed uh, the entire team. It was amazing how uh, Dienzio played. One thing I do want to bring up though was Hollywood Hammers, they had a great Kraken control across the course yep. of the game. Managed to get two Krakens for themselves. The first one, Playboy Afro, Afro <laughs> comes in, <laughs> steals it with an auto attack. I was like, the old man didn't punch it. He just vanguarded himself and took it. Yeah, it was beautiful <laughs> stuff coming out. And then they managed 
managed to get the second one as well. And that was what kept them in the game across the course of things. Because if Immortals had had those two Krakens, they would have been able to push and they would have been able yeah. to end. And I mean, that play that they made with starting all over, going from the back door and taking that turret, if they pull that off one more time after getting the turret, they win the game. Yeah. So it's it was so close to going either way, despite the fact that Immortals started this one off so strong. So Hammer's really able to show some of the resilience here. Yeah, for sure. Now, we had a few words with Immortals before the game started off yesterday, and we were trying to fi figure out how much they were buying into their own hype. So let's see what they had <laughs> to say. For me personally, I like playing on stage. I feel like it motivates me to try harder and seeing all the people just watch me play makes me you know, want to prove myself even more. I think that TSM's a strong and capable team and they're definitely the favorites coming to this tourney, but I definitely think we have a chance to beat them. All the teams at this championship are way stronger than last season. If EU does beat a team, then they really have improved. And there has been some, I guess, rumors going around that EU is getting a lot better. So we just have to wait and see. <laughs> Honestly, there was a lot more humble than I was expecting yeah. to come out from those guys. EU is getting a lot better, so I can still like DNCO off the back of that interview. <laughs> DNCO is always humble when there's a camera on him. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, there was a camera on him on stage that entire time, and that was not a humble game coming out from him. I'm excited to get into the second game of this series. Honestly, I'm kind of hoping that this one's going to go to five games as well. I know it's already been a pretty long day of games so far, but I don't want it to end, because if game one is anything to go on, this is going to be an absolute doozy of a series. Can't wait to see what these guys are going to pull out. But looking towards this next draft then, what is the expectation? Because things like the Adagio is something that you don't near, you don't really anticipate that being a pick unless you're against someone like old school, right? Or is D'Anzio one of these players that you have to start to anticipate that coming in as well? I think you have to start to anticipate it because the Crystal Power laners are becoming more and more prevalent. These players that used to play the Adagio or even you know have played the Adagio uh, throughout this, the time period, even when he's not popular, are going to be picking him up more and more frequently. So it's something that you're going to have to respect, but it's something that you can't really, you can't draft around. You can't build your draft around, okay, we're expecting them to go with the Adagio because it's not going to be a pick that comes out every game. Now, I want to bring up a topic here that, you know, I, I kind of thought it was a bit of a meme before until I just saw that game. DNZO is renowned for having a bit of a land buff, right? This guy yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. loves to perform on stage. Suijay, you've played alongside him on stage. What's it like? Like, d does he transform emotionally? Like, what happens? How does he yeah, suddenly I mean, super saiyan like I this? I played with him, and, uh, and we've sat on so many streams together. He is in another mental state when he's on stage. Um, this kid is just so confident in his own abilities. He just knows how to play and, and outplay the opponent. And that's because Zio is actually a really, really clever and smart kid. Um, he does really well in school, and Tyra is actually really smart, and Max Green is really smart too. But I think that's the reason why you, you see him play so well, is because he's confident and he, he plays really smart. He doesn't panic. All right, well, we'll see whether he can keep that going along the course of this series. It's going to be Catherine and Kestrel, the first two fans of this one. And now Hammers on the A side of the draft, they're going to be locking in the Grace. And Grace being prioritized in this series. Uh, it's kind of what we expected. These two teams played a lot of the grace down the stretch in the regular season. Uh, leaving the Lyra open, neither team really wanting to go for the Lyra because yeah, of the fact that the grace just here. does a lot of there healing. Glaive, Kroll, I mean, this is, again, pretty much what we expect. Yeah, so the Crow ban is really good because against Grace, Crow, that's a, such a strong CC comp that Hammers likes to play. They really like a lot of CC. Now here, Immortals has the option to take Lyra, but they don't need to take Lyra right now. They can secure maybe a strong laner mm -hmm. uh, like Idris, because Hammers will probably play like uh, Celeste again. Ooh. So Adagio is picked up again. Wow. So Celeste will probably get picked up here, but then Blackfeather is still open, um, and Blackfeather we've seen is really good into Celeste. So let's see if Hammers is going to try to play that um, that Celeste again, because now they don't have a Glade, they don't have a Cruel. This is where Hammers needs to win. They need to get a draft that can get a lot of triple CC, and that's how they excel. Yeah, Hammers may have to go back to the you know 2.6 style of draft of going with a Crystal Power in the jungle instead, because a lot of the you know the two most popular of the weapon bruisers for the jungle have been taken off the board. Grumpjaw is still there. We did see Grumpjaw earlier today, so there is a possibility he could come out again, but uh, you know, maybe Lance in the jungle could be a thing, but 
I, I feel like they may go back to something weapon power in the lane. Weapon yeah. power pals available. I mean, there's say. Fox. <laughs> he could go Fox, but I think he's probably going to go with Celeste because Starting loves his Celeste and he carries really hard in it. But again, it's always risky to Adagio Glaive because that's just too much burst against a mage that's so squishy. Um, so I think they probably will opt with Celeste though because of Starting's preference and then go with probably potentially a Black Feather or something well, in the. They've game. actually gone with oh, Fortress. Fortress. The end, so. so they're going to go with Vox Fortress here, I believe. Or the Weapon Power Grace could come on in, or it could be <laughs> CP Fortress in the jungle, we'll have to see. Weapon Power Grace was pretty much an exclusively European thing, so I would expect that to be the CP Fortress going into the jungle. Yeah, oh, Black, Black Feather, Feather gets interesting taken, decision. so they're denying so, it from uh, Immortals here. Really interesting that they went for the triple melee uh, into an Adagio, because they're now all going to be inside the Verse of Judgment when these team fights are yeah, going on. Yeah, that's actually so, really dangerous. Uh, th it's an extremely dangerous composition, and then you, you have a Glaive who can just knock someone out of position. You know, once they jump in, you knock one of them out. They really don't have multiple gap closers. Each one, each member of that team has like one gap closer, and that's about it. Uh, and so, except for the Black Feather, but if you punt away the Fortress or the uh, the, uh, the Grace, then they're not going to have a way to get back into the melee Yeah, Captain-wise, they can do a Batiste. I was just going to say that. Um, but Batiste looks really good because he's going to be able to disable the Fortress, Wolves, and the Ultimate coming their way. And also, if he lands a good Fearsome Shade while Grace is channeling her Divine Inter Intervention, it will cancel the Divine Intervention. So a double Echo is actually really, really dangerous here. Again, Glaive with Batiste is so strong because of the Ordain, right? You have a stun and you have a Glaive stun and you have a Batiste that, that slows with the Mojo. So it's pretty solid draft here from Hammers. However, the late game with Grace going late game, pretty strong composition with a CP Fortress and Grace in the late game. Yeah, this is definitely going to be an interesting one. And once again, we have these two teams, incredible mechanical skill on the stage right now, but two team compositions that require a lot of execution. They're going to require a lot of coordination. Cannot wait to get into this one, and we don't have to wait any longer. It's time to jump into game number two and pass it over to our casters. Thank you very much, guys. And here we go. D'Enzio straight back on that Adagio, but you just said to me two seconds ago, this is a shut D'Enzio composition down. Yeah, this is a just the same way that Blackfeather is a good against Celeste. Blackfeather's pretty good against Adagio for exactly the same reason. Two immobile CP carries that are quite easy to stick to, and that's what Blackfeather's coming in for on the side of Hammers. Very anti-Adagio. You've got the mortal wounds from the fortress, you can get the mortal wounds coming up from the poison shiv that you might see built on this Blackfeather. Very, very interesting here between the two teams, but I think the Batiste was the perfect pick for Immortals to round this out. You get the Echo, the Double Fearsome Shade. This is a composition from Hammers that wants to dive, dive, dive. Do you know what dive, dive, dive gets shut down by? Ridiculous disengage, and that's what the Fearsome Shade, especially with the Echo, can provide here for Immortals. Two very well thought out compositions then. Now, will D'Entio get fed, or will we see starting all over on this Grace, not Captain Grace this time. This is what oh, wow. I was hoping to see, by the way. Okay, Someone playing yeah. very aggressive Grace and starting all over, he's gonna be your man. See, so got a 3v3 here already opening up. Well, speaking of uh, speaking of very aggressive, t Tigers already has to get himself out of there. Uh, Playboy Afro going fairly low, but that fight's just gonna burn him down. Dientio, could this be first blood again? t Tigers is very low, as Dientio picks it up once more. Immortals find first blood in the second game again. And now Hammers, they're trying to make something work here, but T-Tigers is just going to shrug the damage off. Very intelligent from Hammers to back off here. They knew that walking straight into the brush could spell defeat for them. Starting all over is not done yet. He is not done whatsoever. Starting all over going very low. T-Tigers the same. Archaic just trying to find that last executing blow. But T-Tigers just healing all the damage up. Manages to take out starting all over. How is he not dead yet? Hammers, they're on the ropes right now. D'Enzio and Max Green are chasing them up. And T-Tigers picks up a double kill. With no vision, they walk straight into the brush. It gave time to reset. An amazing use of that ordain to stop starting all over charging and stealing the healing Trion. So good that it went over to T-Tigers because it gave him that ability to get back into the fight with the healing from D'Enzio and that regeneration buff from the Trion. And suddenly Immortals off to a 3-0 start here. A start that they I think so desperately need. We need to take stock of things again, though. It's not going to be a power Black Feather. It's going to be a uh, CP Black Feather from the jungle, looking for that range advantage over the Immortals roster here. Feels like it's been a bit of a switch up, but it's a lot of burst damage, a lot of uh, burst damage onto a single target with this Grace and Archaic on the CP Black Feather. 
Now you do have then Playboy Afro bringing the Fortress in to provide those mortal wounds and also the engage potential with that attack of the pack. That's going to be the big trigger for them to pull when they enter these fights. Just making sure they can jump on Dienzio, cut the healing in half, but Max Green's going to be there to back them up. And now T-Tigers, very early aggression on this glaive. We speak about it time and time again, North America, how they differ from EU. Their junglers are so proactive in the way that they want to play, and glaive just seems like a perfect fix. Also note how both uh, support players this time around went for that Dragon Blood contract. Lush looking for early aggression. It definitely makes sense for Hammers, but I like the way that Immortals matched it because it, well, proved so effective there in that three versus three. And the, le the level one of the Immortals composition is very good. You know, you have the ability to lock a target down with the Ordained uh, Glaive weapon power build. Very, very solid early on. The ability to reposition with the Afterburn. Wait a second, we might have a little fight breaking well, afterburn out. Afterburn comes through. They find Playboy Afro. He's taking a fair bit of damage, but starting all over is going to be in the front line, the main target. That Mojo flying through. Okay, it's going to join the fight also. Not level six, so we can't actually just use that Rose Offensive to get in on the action. And in fact, Immortals are just happy with that trade. One of the redeeming things for Hammers here is once they hit that level eight on the Black Feather, they're going to have a range advantage over Immortals. They're going to have a very long range. Wait a second, Max Green's got to be careful. He's in a lot of trouble. Does use the boots to get away, though. DNCO will be there for the healing. So level eight on Black Feather is going to give them a serious range advantage over the Immortals' composition in terms of the ability to spam that on point from a considerable distance. The rest of the Hammer's composition was going to have to be very careful about when they choose to engage, because it is a very telegraphed engage from your Hammer's, and it means it's very easy for Max Green to pick out the perfect time for a Fearsome Shade. Fearsome Shade is going to shut both the Grace and the Fortress down when they come to look. Oh! oh hello! Just it up, and you get bitten. T-Tigers just takes down Playboy Afro. Archaic still wants a little bit of the action, though. Can't really find all too much. Playboy Afro had no idea what was coming. At the Glaive, it was looking like he was searching for starting, so Playboy Afro walked behind the Glaive. Bam! Turns around, smacks the Fortress back into the team, and he goes down. A great start for Immortals here. Very aggressive as well, as they need to be. t is a 3-0 right now, with the four-minute mark on a Glaive. Bam. You want to get an early tension bow on that? You want to get early damage items on? Perfect position. Dienzio right now not looking like the carry. It's T Tiger's turn. Look, if there is any member of the Immortal or even a jungler in North America that if you give a carry jungler two will just start to run away with things, I think T Tiger is the perfect, perfect example of that. If you give him something that's going to be monstrous when it gets fed, he will carry with it. Well, Max Green looking like he wants to have a little bit of DNC here right now. Ordain's going to come outside, delivering a lot of trouble. That's going to be a massive fountain to heal them all up. However, T Tiger's now on the front line. He's going to be very, very careful. Starting to deliver, ends up falling. Though DNC is just a basic attack, but they do trade one for one. A shutdown comes through, but no immortals still managing to pick up the kill onto Archaic in the end. Playboy Afro can really do anything at all. Starting all over, doesn't have the damage. Neither does Archaic right now with just the Shaggler. The tension bow was there for T Tiger as well. The burst was pretty heavy from them. And you've got a lot of sustain coming out from Immortals right now with only one way to apply that Mortal Wounds at this point in time. And that is just the Playboy Afro. That is a single target application of the uh, Mortal Wounds as well. So it's gonna go onto a target that you're currently focusing. And obviously you can then play around that with the use of Gift of Fire onto different targets. And I mean, this is just a, a good starting of a snowball from the early game here from uh, Immortals. And, just trying to carry this on. When we get, once we get to level six, you can already see Max Green is second item Echo here because of how important the Echo Fearsome Shade is going to be for this composition. Really love the prioritization from him here. He knows the win conditions. Well, the win conditions is kill Max Green right now, apparently down to about quarter HP. The Ordain is going to come through. T Tigers looking for an entrance, can't quite find it after the Pope from Archaic did end up landing. TNTO still managing to heal the rest of his team up, not an issue, but. Max Green's going to go back now. He's got a bit of ch he's got a chunk of change in his pocket. Almost being able to pick up that echo now. Yeah, he'll be uh, saving that up. About a thousand gold away, I believe, something like that. So he'll be able to get it in the next couple of minutes, especially once he hits level six. Like we said, that very important time. Could obviously use for a double ordained if he absolutely has to, but obviously for the most part, you're looking to use that on the fearsome shade. T Tigers. Oh, going to have to burn away here. Have to burn over the wall. I've always liked his blade, by the way, the big Sora blade looking thing he's got on there. Hang on a second, though. Ordain is going to come down starting all over. I'm going to interrupt myself as Dienzio is going to have to kite away. Three members of Hammers cannot touch Dienzio, it seems. Not on Max Green there. However, the damage does come through now. The Fountain is going to heal him up, and still, turret a little bit too far forward there, and they will be end up just uh, walking away. Divine Intervention used as well to heal them up. Just so you know, Jaws, that's actually Sora blade for Glaive. It is the Sora blade Glaive skin. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. You corrected me. You said that big Sora blade looking thing. I was <laughs> genuinely a Sora blade. What I was going to say <laughs> was the little missile looking thing on the back. Oh, you know, when you use it after burning, oh. it's like it's going to send him fly. Yeah, that's what I was going to uh, say. Okay. But I interrupted myself. It was a fight. Come on. Yeah, okay, dude. I got Thank you. you. I got you. We have fun. Immortals now looking at the power spikes here. Like you said, Max Green, only about 500 now off that Echo. And. Playboy Afro is going to be the main initiator with that attack of the pack. As soon as I get Fish some Shade, you've got to imagine he's kind of done, leaving yeah. Dienzio to do a lot of the damage. He's nearing his second tier two, uh, tier three item as well. Well, they knew that Playboy Afro's second item is going to be Crucible. It's absolutely necessary against a Batiste to have that Crucible on board and against an Adagio. There's a couple of, you know, it's all about it. It's going to be really... Uh, it's so interesting to approach this game for, for Hammers because you have a lot of decisions in team fights to be made. Do we do we block the initial foray of the, the Batiste ultimate or do we need to block the Adagio ultimate? Because a, a dive composition like this, if they get a big Adagio ultimate on them and they've already used their Crucible, you are going to get shut down when you're right on top of the target that you want to kill. So it's almost going to be a lose-lose situation in terms of Crucible use here for Hammers. They might even have to consider a double Crucible at some point in this composition. Maybe starting all over picks that up himself, maybe Archaic thinks about it, but I think a double Crucible might genuinely be necessary. Oh, speaking about build pass then, let's look at this new Rising Star up-and-comer in starting all over. Obviously gone for this Weapon Power Grace build. Is there room for an Echo there as well? That's the normally the second item for a Grace here. They're not going to have that available to them in these fights, it seems. No, I don't think Echo and Grace is going to be used here. Maybe later on into the game, because you want to keep those diving targets alive, especially maybe even yourself. But no, I think uh, I think Echo will be on the last of priorities here for Immortals to go in. in. Day. There's the attack of the pack. Dienzio is going to be the main target there, but it doesn't matter because play starting all over is already down. Mass! Versa Judgment does not play boy Afro. He is very tanky, but Dienzio is just going to burn him alive. Another attack will just finish him off. And now the hunt is on. Archaic almost falls. Nice use of the reflex block. No, sorry, the Rose offensive to get out of the Ordained. Immortals, though, looking to take that first tier turret now. And again, you saw the catch 22 for Hammers. We can block the disengage from Batiste, but we can't block the Versa Judgment. Check this out here. Immortals actually the ones to find the engage. They thought they could st uh, stop starting all over. They are going to use the block on the Batiste ultimate, but immediately afterwards, Dienzio channels that verse of judgment. He was too healthy to take down quickly. And again, that's the, that's the, that's the conundrum that Hammers are going to face every single team fight, unless they get a double crucible open. You know, it, they're going to be facing that every single time a team fight breaks out. Well, you said as soon as that echo comes online, you'll have a lot of shades to deal with. Be very fearful for them, and that's good. That was the main issue there as well. Vengeance came down, and hey, I've got another fearful share by the way. T Tigers, is it gonna go in? That's the question. Hey, decided, decided against it apparently. Now, Immortals seem to be on the defensive here, and what can Hammers really do to win a fight? They are not yet like ignore the goal, just the kills again are just so far in favor of Immortals right now. It seems like they cannot find a fight. Or Dane's gonna come through. T Tigers is gonna find one. Starting the is gonna be the tiger once again. Attack of the back is gonna land on Dienzio, but IK almost solos him out. But that turret's gonna help finish off the kill. Now starting all over, trying to kill him, but it's not gonna be enough. That giant Sora Blade just cutting him up. And that will be Playboy Afro. Tail between his legs. Gonna have to go back to base. And this could be Immortals taking their second turret already. Look, you, you mentioned how or Hammer's going to lose a fight. It's going to require a serious mistake from Immortals. Some mistiming, some ma miscommunication between the use of their, their sort of team white CC. Immortals have got the perfect way to shut Hammer's down. And unless Hammer's builds a double crucible, they find the dive onto Dienzio and kill him almost instantaneously. It's going to be very, very difficult for Hammer's to win this one out. I do like the Poison Shift pickup for starting all over. I was wondering whether his Weapon Power Grace, uh, Grace build was going to include that. I think it is necessary against the likes of an Adagio. But you, I think one of the win conditions now for Hammers has to be the use of that Black Feather. You get that broken myth. You start to stack with the Poison Shift. I think that's why Immortals have been actually been looking for the engages themselves. They know that they cannot play at range against the CP Black Feather over and over again. So if they find an opportunity to find an engage in their favor, because, I mean, what, what are Hammers going to do? If Immortals engage in them, what do Hammers actually do? Do they turn around and run? Do they try and force a fight? Even if they do, they're just going to get near loaded with this team-wide CC that they just don't have the way to defend against. So, 
I think Immortals are very happy to let Hammers engage, but they're also very happy to engage themselves. It's a win-win situation for the team right now. Oh, Dane yet again, Afterburn comes through. Wartro's gonna get popped from Immortals. Attack of the back with Dienzio's left completely alone to just free hit on the back line. Fierce from Shade does come through. Fierce, three members of Hammers, but it just pushes them the wrong way. So Immortals can't quite find the kill yet. However, that gold miner is on the board. There are a couple of brink and health bars there from Immortals. Very, very quick use of the double shade from Max Green there. Maybe could have held on to it for a bit longer. Actually helped Hammers move back into their own side jungle to disengage. Here we go, oh, though. Hang on a second. Afterburn straight into Archaic with that massive Benediction. Not the Benediction. The Divine Intervention is going to come up to heal them up. Time will over once again. Missing that. Oh, locked in place by the Holy Nova. Won't quite find anything. As soon as you're locked into that animation, you know the damage is going to come through. Ends up going down. And again, Immortals can search for these engages because Hammers... Let's, let's pretend we are hammers right now. We have a composition that is designed to dive the carrier Dagio, but you can't because of the mass disengage that the Immortals team are bringing to the, to, the, to the side of the game. If you get engaged on, what are you gonna do as Immortals? You have a composition that's not supposed to counter engage, it's not supposed to the kite. It is a composition that dives. So when you engage, you say, oh wow, they're doing the work for us, they're engaging, we're gonna jump on them, but that's not what they wanna do because they don't have a way to defend against the double um, Batista ultimate, they don't have a way to defend against the Verse of Judgment. It is just a lose-lose situation. You can't engage as hammers, but you also can't disengage as hammers. Immortals have got them down, nailed to a post. You mentioned Max Green, and I think back to London, and I say he didn't perform so well. In fact, he struggled in London. He seems to have cleared all that up now and performing out of his mind on this Batiste. He's 1-0 and 9. The Fearsome Shade, that was one time that it wasn't really necessary, maybe, but he's still doing a heck of a job. Well, Dane is going to get blocked, but T-Target has found the target he wants. It's going to be Playboy Afro. Attack of the fact that the massive Fearsome Shade used once again. Echo has been popped. We can use that cooldown yet again, but look at Dienzio once more. Another massive Fearsome Shade. Archaic's going to be the first casualty of war. That Mortal Wound isn't going to do too much, but the healing's not even there. Ridiculous, Dienzio again. He's 7-0. and zero. This is a reminiscent of game number one apart from Hammers, only with the one kill. You needed to win very early on for Hammers here, and I've got to say, the level one fight that gave Immortals that 3-0 was literally the, almost the nail in the coffin for Hammers. Hammers needed to snowball. They needed to get a massive advantage before Echo became a thing on the Batiste. I mean, look, let's take a look here. Starting actually uses the, bened uh, the Benediction onto a minion, so doesn't even get the most effect out of it, but Hammers, they try to go back in, they get buffed back by the, uh, the Fearsome Shade on the Echo, and suddenly, the Enzio untouched, able to clean up, and Hammers have got nothing left in the tank after that first engage. I mean, I, this is a game that needed to be snowballed by Hammers. They haven't snowballed, and it's just resulted in the Immortals' composition being superior in teamfights. There's, there's almost nothing else you can say about it. It's a matter of formalities for Immortals now. They should get won by them, and if they if they lose it, it's going to be due to some severe misplays in teamfight situations. Well, Playboy Afro is going to flare out that brush to his demise. However, Tag the Mac is going to get popped. Look at the fear some Shade just rattling through DNCO with this huge job, but he doesn't quite find anybody as RK gets healed up, and now he is a 1v3 situation. Situation. Max Green, the real cooldown's there. Fearsome Shade scares them away, but hang on a second. Dienzio once more, he goes big! An ace comes through for Immortals. Took the words right out of my mouth. And they're gonna run this down towards the vein. Crystal Immortals searching for their second win in this series. They have come to the Unified Life Championships to show that they are a contender here. Jaws. Splitting the aggro on these vein crystal turrets. I don't think they've got enough time. They're gonna have to back up Gonna play this one safe. They don't need to take risks because they just straight up win these team fights Immortals have got a game plan set and ready to deal with hammers it seems Right now, they're just on a different level. Let's have a look at this replay. So actually, Immortals set this up in a really bad way. There's no good place to use your Fierce and Shade here. The block initially was super strong, and then unfortunately, Max Green was in a good position to actually find a reset and use it once more. Dienzio surviving here was cr key, but Max Green held onto that Fierce and Shade for such a long time, found the perfect position to use it in, and actually gets a clean key kill up here, and Dienzio 
just able to uh, clean things up once he gets that disengage off. But actually, Immortal set that up in a really bad position. Oh, T Tigers, they found one. That's going to be a big block on the ordain, but the Fizz from Shade's going to hit. The Wolves come out. The Fizz, or the Versa Judgment's going to strike Drew as well. But Archaic still alive in the back line here, just trying to find this Dienzio. There's the Fountain. Archaic's going to fall already to Max Green. What is going on here? They finally find Dienzio. They kill him for the first time in this game, but they can't find anything more. Playboy Afro once again. The last member alive for Hammers. Immortals getting very, very aggressive in these team fight situations here. Very antsy to try and close this one out. T Tigers and Max Green are gonna start up this crack and Playboy Afro might have something to say about this. You do have to respect a Fortress's damage, even if he is going through that captain role. He's looking to try and delay this as long as possible, maybe even look for that miracle steal. Doesn't have attack of the pack, so can't send that out. You gotta do it at this point. This is your only way back into the game. You've got a single turret. You need to be able to steal this Kraken. Can it be done? The stun comes through, but no. Immortals secure it, and now Playboy Afro on the wrong side of business, the wrong side of the jungle. And Kraken screeching at him. He falls, and Immortals now, they're just marching on the base. One turret stands between them and taking the second game of the series with match points. They've got a massive advantage here. They've got the Kraken. They can even just even distract Hammers and Kraken will do the work. This should be the second game going over to Immortals. They have looked so incredibly strong here, playing something that is just so easily executed from the very get-go. Max Green has been amazing on this Batiste. Some incredible ultimates from him and well-used and timed Echo. And Immortals going to run this down to take the final Vein Crystal. Their last chance, their last opportunity to make something happen here. Attack of the pack once more is going to get unleashed. Look at Dienzio trying to kite back here. Archaic's in the 1v1, but they're just going to get completely ignored here. Massive Verge of Judgment. Is it going to be enough? Archaic is finally going to find him, but the Kraken's still knocking on the crystal. Match point to Immortals. And they're very, very close now to just sweeping hammers. So well executed from Immortals. The composition was so perfect at dealing with what Hammers brought to the table. An odd change up of heroes and their build pass for Hammers. Maybe not as optimal as it could have been there, but that initial level one fight for me was what sealed the deal. Hammers needed to snowball. They didn't. Immortals then took it in their favor, prioritized the echo because the disengage was so important for them in these fights. And it was, like I said, matter of formalities right there. Max Green played like a beast, but Dienzio on Adagio once more. You just can't stop him. You gotta ban the Adagio, apparently. Dienzio and live buff for Immortals in general is coming through, but can Hammers pull out the reverse sweep? We'll have to wait and find out to break that game down even further. We have Joe and the guys on the desk. I think maybe Immortals just needed a game to warm up or something because the second game was dominant from that squad. When you look at the, the kills at the end of the game, it was almost 10 times the kills of their opposing team. That, that was an absolute masterclass. It wasn't even so much that they needed game to warm up because this is how game one started. This is just what happens when Kraken doesn't get stolen. That's about it. That's really the only thing that was different in this game was Kraken didn't get stolen, <laughs> so Hammers didn't get that big comeback attempt. Instead, this was just Immortals cleanly playing all the way through the start to finish. Yeah, also, if you look at it, the early game tells you a lot in both games. It's just IMT just played the early game better and cleaner. Um, that always normally reflects into the mid game and the late game. And I thought that the uh, Grace parry was really creative but I felt like they needed to combo with something else because Blackfeather needs to poke a little bit more and I felt like starting over was too aggressive on it. I mean, I don't want to say I told you so with the weapon grace. It's but, an EU but thing did, though. I did it works in him. EU. <laughs> you you uh, said it would happen and I don't. I do want to say I told you so in that I didn't win. <laughs> like, I mean, you didn't say it won't win. You I said it said, won't happen. I so. said it anyway, won't win. Back to the game, back weeks. to the game. One thing I want to say though, it's going to be really tough to decide if Immortals wins the next one, which could happen, but Max Green and Zio are playing out of their minds. I mean, Tyre's playing really well too, but Max Green, when he positioned that yeah. there's some shade and got a 2v3 and, and they got a they got an ace and saved Zio's life, and Zio just carried yeah, on that doesn't get clipped, it was I'm just insane. Be like, disappointed he waited for the community. right moment. If you look at Max, he waited for the right moment. I can't wait to see the replay, but he waited for and positioned himself in a perfect spot yeah, and then unleashed a fearsome shade. I mean, it was just amazing how Max Green played. Honestly, one of the best fearsome shades I think I've ever seen so far. <laughs> like, <laughs> just an exceptional play. And, and that's kind of the story of Immortals on all three players so far this series. Like, I. I you can barely criticize this team right now. They are looking terrifying. And this is exactly what we needed to see out of the teams 
on day one who need to see incredibly strong performances. So tomorrow in the international play and looking towards the semis and the finals, you, if you're not looking great in these games today, you don't stand a chance later on. Yeah, this was the Immortals that we had heard about all through the first split of this season. This was the Immortals we were expecting to show up in the challenge battles, expecting to show up in the second split of the regular season. They are playing incredible being Yeah, right and now. I mean, they're, they're playing mechanically so well, too. I mean, they're comboing their ordain with the afterburn. This Tigers holds his afterburn at the right moment. I mean, all three of them are just playing so smart and outplaying their team. But this is the fight here. This is insane. But just watch Max screen here. I mean, he 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 perfectly position. He has the fearsome shade, right? On a soft cooldown. He waits for the right position. He walks up, lines himself up to get this off. And then look, Zeo could have died in one more auto attack, but he gets up just in time here. And then Zeo is able to kill starting and then kill Black Feather because of that fearsome shade. And it lasts 1.6 seconds, and that's just enough time for Zeo to get the ace. And yeah. if that if that highlight does not end up clipped and all over Twitter. I'm going to be extremely disappointed because that was insane. Yeah, I mean, w we kept on talking earlier about Toph being this captain carry. I feel like Mike Screen just stole that title right there <laughs> yeah. because that was just simply beautiful. And that is going to net Immortals a second game in this series. Now, we had a few words with Hammers before jumping into the series yesterday. And I want to see how they were feeling coming into this one, how confident they were feeling, because in game one, they looked great. Game two is starting to fall off. I was kind of like nervous at first, but like now like I got over it, so yeah. All the practice we've been doing the past few weeks, few months, we're going to put all of that practice into tomorrow's tournament to really be new ones. The reason I like compete in Bangalore is because like, the competition, just uh, like traveling, meeting new people. I compete in VG to win. To win. <laughs> Obviously feeling confident going into yesterday, saying they've done a lot of preparation, but I mean, realistically, they have a very difficult first opponent. I don't want to take anything away from the Hammers, but Immortals, they're looking fantastic in this series and, and looking like the team that people were wanting them to be coming into the Vainglory 8. 27, 4 and 13. God, Zio is just playing out of his mind. And he always does every live event. You know, this is, I mean, every time he's come with a full roster, not to not to put anything back on the, the London Championship, it wasn't the full <laughs> starting roster. Um, but he just Absolute plays crap, enough, no matter Lisa. what on stage. Zio is just probably the best laner on stage. And, and I'm putting that next to like Chuck and all the other top laners I as well. I was going to say, there's definitely some people tomorrow that would like to contest <laughs> that title. We'll see, we'll see. Definitely across the course of today, I think he quite comfortably earns that title, but the series is not over yet. So we'll have to see whether he can maintain that performance. And Hammers now, we have to talk about morale at this stage because they are 2-0 down in this series. And I believe this is the first time we've seen a 2-0 scoreline. I'm pretty sure the other series went 1-1 to start things off, perhaps. I think uh, Nova was up 2-0. Yeah, Nova was up 2-0. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then they lost the third game. But definitely, <laughs> Immortals... Hammers looking to repeat. Yeah. <laughs> Hammers, I mean, potentially look towards a reverse sweep, but that's the only way they stay in the tournament. That is a huge mountain to climb at this early, early stage in the oh, series. Oh, the Adagio the ban comes out. Yeah, and you, we were talking about, is this going to be something that they do? Will they ban the Adagio? And it, it's... It's always a difficult choice because you're going to have to give something over if you yeah. do ban away the Adagio, but you have to go off with the momentum as well. And it, the Adagio has just been so strong, they have not been able to figure out a way to beat it, so they needed to take it off the board. Grace is taken, Hammers will probably take the Catherine here, and now force a Batiste ban on the side of Immortals. Um, and then from there, Hammers will probably ban and probably pick up Kestrel because uh, Archaic or starting wants to play either a weapon lane Kestrel or they want to play a CP Kestrel. But that is super risky against a Grace because of the range 9 benediction that can get on the Kestrels extremely easily. I really want to see them just go with the box. They're going to first pick the Kestrel. They're not even going to... Yeah, it, wow. I, okay. I don't really like the Kestrel first picks. It's, it, like you mentioned, it is very risky and it's... You know, you, yes, you can flex it into the jungle if you want to, but it's very likely going to be in the lane for starting all over. And as you mentioned, extremely risky pick with the grace there. And now there's, you know, obviously Immortals are going to be able to pick two things that could counter it as well. I mean, it is a very risky pick, but I feel like starting all over is a very risky kind of player. He loves <laughs> to go 
for risky situations and try and pull off the greatest opportunity that he can. And Kestrel is something that we saw him do excellent work with during the group stages, so or during the regular season, sorry. We'll see whether he can bring that to the stage. He yeah. needs to bring something to the stage right now if he wants to stay in the series. Yeah, and I think it most you probably take away the Catherine because that's something that Afro plays extremely well on. Actually, they're going to take away the Lyra, they're not a Lyra instead. Hmm. So that gives Hammers the Catherine and then uh, maybe they want Archaic on potentially a Samuel or flex that into a CP Kestra, we'll see. Or could even go with the Captain Batiste if that's left open, because you know, oh, Batiste yeah, right. not likely to be picked up with a Grace. Those two don't really synergize too well together, but uh, you know, it is a possibility now if they or do grab the Catherine, they could try and get the Batiste or grab the Cast, grab, grab the, the Batiste, Batiste first. Yeah. And you, you're very unlikely to see Immortals Force pick up them into weapon power But then Immortals will do a Catherine <laughs> with a weapon grace, maybe, or something? I don't know. If we'll they see. want this to go to game four, maybe. <laughs> well, we'll see where Hammers are going to go with this one. It certainly feels like Batiste could be a very solid pick. But, I mean, maybe oh, that's just the not a position instead. they want to go for. Okay, so they're not going to opt for a Batiste. So there's going to be a weapon glaive lane, probably, when starting. He actually plays a weapon glaive extremely well. And it's going to be a CP Kestrel here. And they probably took the Glaive away because Glaive with Grace, it's actually pretty deadly into a Kestrel weapon or CP. I mean, Glaive with Grace is pretty deadly into just about anything. <laughs> it's an extremely <laughs> strong duo. It's right up there with the Idris. You know, anyone that can have that really strong dive potential is extremely strong with a Grace. So I still expect Immortals to try and find someone who has that dive potential for T-Tigers to be a big playmaker with. Glaive there with a 50.6% win rate there, just peeking over <laughs> the average there, but definitely an, an incredibly strong pick going into Kestrel specifically. Oh, the Batiste comes out, and that means it's going to be a weapon power leaner. Potentially Ringo, Gwen here could work as well. Uh, there's That's going to be triple stun in terms of CC in general. So we got to see Vox. There and it there is. We go. Vox will come I've been out. wanting to see a Vox all series. Zeo after, on his box. after looking up and seeing that both of these carries were undefeated on a Vox in the regular season, I wanted to see Vox come out here, and it is going to be Dienzio that gets his hands on it. Yeah, and then uh, they'll probably pick up Catherine here, um, given what the composition is. However, like, oh, Samuel's going to. So it's a, it's a Captain Glaive instead, and then a Weapon Catcher, I assume. It's a very interesting draft here on the side of Hammers because it's kind of smart because Glaive is not good into a more composition. If they do a lane Glaive, he will get CC'd and destroyed by, Gla uh, by Grace and the Batiste. And Vox is just really mobile. He can just jump around the Glaive, so a weapon Glaive would not work in that situation. So I do like how they change their draft up a little bit here. I'm interested to see how this one's going to play out. There is a huge amount of weight on the shoulders of these Hammers players right now. If they want to keep their tournament lives, they have to take this game and they have to look towards a reverse sweep. It's certainly a tall task, but we've seen crazier things here in the Vainglory 8. It's time to get into game three of this series and see whether Immortals can turn it into a hat trick. Well, there we go, Hammers, they need to find the reverse sweep now. They are on the ropes of not making it to day number two. Immortals with two very definitive games. We'll see if they can pull off a third. I think this composition from Hammers is a lot better. They can look to be very aggressive in the jungle early on. A lot of people say that the Batiste Samuel is a skill matchup. I've always felt that the range advantage that Samuel brings is often sort of overlooked in how good he is into Batiste specifically. But again, if they can get rolling in the early jungle here, get Samuel moving, get him into lane to siege that first turret of the game, that could be where Hammers look for a win, or even try and get an advantage. Because let's 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 start from square one here. Hammers have to get an advantage to even think about a win. They need to play this early game smart. They need to play this early game solid. There is no way they can give away the same level of pressure that they've given away to Immortals early on here. Hammers need to get off to a flying start. They will need to. At least they banned away the Adagio. That was the big question mark. Will they or will they not ban it away from Dienzio? 10.0 KDA right now, as of game number three. We'll see if he can extend it or will Hammers deplete it? We'll have to wait and see. This could be the third and final game here. If, Hammer, if Immortals take it, Hammers need to find this reverse sweep to move on to day number two. We're on to the fold. If you're a betting man, and you had bet against Immortals with Dienzio's six nil record on Vox, I assure you the odds would be very, very good in terms of return because the SEO is unbeaten on this hero this season. Playboy Afro starting an aggressive move into the lane here, just helping starting 
put some pressure on, pushing that wave into Zio early on. And Starling all over, he already pegged him as this the newest up and coming star, but Dienzio's are pretty pretty sure he's firm enough now to say that actually no, I am the star here on this stage. He's proving it thus far. Playboy Afro looking for a small engage here, but with Max Green in the wings. Is it gonna be able to find Dienzio? See Tigers putting a little bit of pressure down onto Archaic now. Archaic trying to just try and push Tigers away here, but with that vision control, they can see Archaic moving in and out of his brush. They'll know that central Triant is still available, but it's going to be a very, very passive start for both of these guys early on. They're looking to put their advantages and put pressure on in the lane here, which is very interesting because they would have felt that if you can get Samuel rolling against the Batiste, you can start to put some huge pressure in the lane towards the five-minute mark. This way, you're going to try and I guess pressure out Dienzio, but I don't think that's going to work easily. You've got to get to the Grey. She's got great peel against that Glaive as well. And Zio is obviously very good at negotiating his way around CC with that Sonic Zoom. I want to point out to everybody in the audience somebody watching the stream as well, you did predict it. You did predict the Vox in the draft. Oh, thanks, bud. It's all right, no worries. You know, I he needs to give you the credit you deserve. I think... the. The Gwen and the, the Ringo would have been fine, but they're very weak to Glaive specifically. Vox less so, because you have that ability to just use that Sonic Zoom. So even if you get Afterburn, you can always Sonic Zoom to reposition and start kiting. Glaive and, uh, uh, sorry, Gwen and Ringo, if you do get Afterburn, if you do get caught out, they're a lot more vulnerable. So, uh, and, and Zio is just, you know, they, they want this very mobile composition here from, from Hammers. They want the ability to, sorry, from, from Immortal. They want the ability to either kite backwards if necessary or chase down the likes of Starting to try and keep their, their tags on it. Because if you give Starting space in this Kestrel, if you allow him to flank, if you allow him to find positions easily, he is going to burst someone very quickly. Remember that the Wack Power Kestrel build that is quite popular right now hits like a truck once it gets those four items underway. So you always have to be very, very conscious about where that Wack Power Kestrel is and if you give her enough space, she will run away with it. That's what Archaic's going to be able to produce as well, that Drifting Dark and the Oblivion. So we'll have to wait and see how they do work together in these fights. Now T-Tigers will continue into Archaic. That dueling potential is absolutely massive in the early game. Well, Dane's oh, going to come through. That, that mojo was just ridiculous. 300. Oh, Playboy Afro hops over the wall. Hey, buddy, you're very low as well. He actually has to boots away instead. That is the, the one advantage that you can have as a uh, Batiste if you actually get into close range before Samuel can use that uh, Malice and Verdict from range. You can negotiate your way around those Malice and Verdict missiles and obviously then just spam your um, bad mojo and get the massive damage onto a very squishy target. Archaic is just being out-rotated by T-Tigers and the fact that T-Tigers is getting into position to find these catches onto Archaic more quickly than Archaic can find that range. Again, he's just going to face check T-Tigers. Oh, once again. Max Rini is here as well. T-Tigers might be looking for a little something more here. Starting all over, has rotated down from the lane. And with Payboy Afro on at the sidelines as well. It could be very hard to actually determine where he is. Actually, he is going to get afterburned into the fray. However, Eldained is going to come up, and that's going to be a big Holy Nova from Max Green to disengage Varkeg. Not quite done with them. Actually, trades up a lot of damage. And in fact, Hammers are going to be more than happy with that trade, it seems. Hammers may be now looking towards starting getting incredibly fed here. They've let Dienzio do his own thing. He's now picked up that Poison Shift, the classic first item on a Vox. He'll work towards what is likely going to be a Sorrow Blade. There is a, a case for the Tension Bow, but the DPS with the Tension Bow Poison Shift build on Vox is very low right now. The only reason you would consider a Tension Bow this time round is you've got two very squishy targets that you want to take down. So Tension Bow could be good in that scenario. But the classic build on Vox in this current update is the Poison Shift into the Sorrow Blade. And then that just gives you the damage necessary to then work towards that breaking point and start stacking that in the late game. I feel that the tension bow for build now for Vox is just too low DPS. So we'll have to see where Dienzo makes his choices. But again, if you were to go tension bow, it is perfectly fine into a double squishy, but you may find that the DPS in the late game is not quite as good as it was on 7.16. Mortals have the prowess in the lane. They've got the ability now to push out with Dienzio picking up that poison shear. It's going to be a lot of the healing being tonight as well. Playboy Afro on the side. I just can't imagine a world where actually Playboy Afro makes a play onto someone like Dienzio. They've got Max Green to back them up, go in with a benediction, Holy Nova someone up, and just make sure starting all over can't get his damage down. How do they actually play out these team fights if your hammers right now?
It's really difficult because I think one of the major things that you do have is this, the range advantage. You've got incredible siege, you've got incredible poke with those uh, glimmer shots and the uh, malice and verdicts. That is where you can get a lot of work done here. Cienzio refusing to let them go. Holy Nova is going to miss, but he's happy just to 1v1 starting all over. Oblivion's going to sling one, but the rest of his team are just going to fall with him, or almost with him there as Fable Afro does use the after to get away. Immortals once again finding first blood, and it will be on T-Tigers. Tigers now moving into the back of the jungle here. Just looking to steal away things. I like this move. They're not going to get their first turret because of the wave clear coming up from Archaic, but they can get some of these camps down, and T-Tigers will steal the healing camp and just walk away very happily. Archaic's going to boots in. They want to contest this tree on here. Yeah, they do. Max Green is here also to join the party, and the Sentry as well is making his appearance, but Hammers can't really find anything off that. The chunk, the little chips of damage Immortals can do to Hammers' turrets is going to be invaluable to them later on because, like you mentioned, Hammers, their siege and poke potential is just so strong. So when you have a Samuel and a Kestrel, you want to be the team shoving waves and putting pressure onto turrets, especially around the five to seven minute mark. The fact that Immortals are the ones that are pressuring turrets, and the only times that Hammers ever get the opportunity to move onto the turret is when they are either counter pushing or responding to Immortals. It shows that there is a serious lack of proactivity from the Hammers composition. You, when you run this composition, the one thing that you have is incredible mid game siege potential. You can just walk up to the enemy turret, Malice averted in Drifting Dark, use those glimmer shots and take a turret very quickly. They're not finding those opportunities readily enough here, and if they are, Immortals are responding very quickly. A uh, Benediction in, Ordain's gonna come on, starting all over, trapped in a different space than he wants to be, does use active camo to get away, T-Tiger's now gonna be in the fray as well, Dienzio still quite back, but he's just gonna get killed by Playboy Afro, in fact, a 1-1 trade is starting all over, does fall as well to Max Green. Now, it's T-Tiger's versus Playboy Afro, or Archaic even, I'm gonna be able to do all too much now with a 1-1 trade going through. The Tigers picked up the Shatter Glass, so huge damage against the Double Squishy. Shatter Glass is classically very good into these types of compositions because your bad mojos, especially when empowered, are going to hit very hard. Going to get another couple of steals away here. Max Green gladly going to accept that. Dienzio actually cancelled quite a few basic attacks in that fight. Didn't quite find the killing blow quickly enough, but is working towards that Sorrow Blade, like we said. So he's going to go down the more accepted build path on seven, seven, uh, sorry, 217 which is just that Sorrow Blade giving you better damage output as the game progresses. The problem with the Tension Bow on Vox now is that his damage output just isn't good enough in the late game. And once he gets that Sorrow Blade, wait a second. Oh, Dienzio gets repositioned, but Max Green wants a chunk of the action starting all over. Got jumped on there, just immediately had to disengage. That was really nice for Max Green, because not only did he provide the shield for Dienzio, he also started body blocking those uh, body blocking those uh, Glimmer Shots. They're going to get the first turret of the game at eight minutes here. Ordain is going to come out. Playboy Afro, oh, that was, a, that was a bit of a sneaky BM. Just recalling in the Ordain. They can't really follow this up. This is going to be their problem, it feels. So that was a, uh, that should have really happened maybe two to three minutes ago. If you were running this composition to be proactive and aggressive in the lane, you kind of just walk into lane with Samuel, you sit there with your Kestrel, you consistently pressure the turret. Now, they get the first turret of the game that is good for Hammers, but it's a little bit late. They're going to start to snowball. Oh no, Dienzio caught. Wrong place, wrong time. Fearsome Shade, not quite enough to dissuade them. Now T-Tigers is caught in a 1v3. Ordain does come out. There's the bad mojos, but Playboy Afro takes the kill regardless. That scout trap, MVP right there. It showed that they were moving towards uh, their jungle, and it was a really good execution by Playboy Afro. They might now be able to snowball off the back of that turret. They're going to start to push onto this second one here. They've got a bit of time to do so as well. The response from uh, Immortals will be quick, though, as uh, T-Tigers has just now respawned. It'll be quick and it'll be just, but Playboy Afro using the afterburn to reposition Max Green so he couldn't get anything more than just a basic attack off. Now, Holy Nova landed there, might have turned into something, but it was getting completely denied. Clockwork finish for T-Tigers. This is the big two-item spike for a CP Batiste coming from the jungle. Max Green will be working towards Echo. You can see the energy battery picked up. I love the fact that he's gone for a metal jacket second here. He's going to be body blocking as much as he can from starting all over. The siege starts up for Immortals, but the wave clear is good from Hammers. They're actually oh, going to catch on. Yes, Max Green just gets repositioned again. Oblivion comes through. Oh, he slept in the Oblivion, but still managed to get the ultimate off. Fearsome some shade's going to find them. But regardless of the fact, Archaic does find a Madison verdict to kill onto Max Green. Now Dientio on the run. Immortal so desperate to get some sort of return. Pause comes out here. I'll have to just wait and see what that's all about, but man. It was a 
been a, a good start for Hammers here. They're doing what they needed to do, albeit a bit slower than some other teams would execute on, but they are doing what they need to do here. Very, very aggressive in the lane. That's where their team composition shines, their ability to just move up to a turret and take it very quickly. They've actually had some good vision control that has caught out the Immortals roster, especially around that jungle area. They just need to keep doing that, keep searching for fights, keep singling out targets, and then trying to take those neutral objectives, because they've got great neutral objective control with a weapon power Kestrel. They've got great uh, turret taking potential with the Samuel and the weapon power Kestrel as well. Yeah, it doesn't like we're in a quick technical pause. Hammers maybe having a little something, little something wrong, but we should be getting into the game very, very shortly, guys. They're with us. But here, Hammers, they're fighting back now. They really are. They're, they're pushing Immortals to the limits. It seems now D'Antio not on the Adagio. Can't be the impactful Vox player he needs to be right now. And I've got to say, this Glaive pick has worked out wonders for Hammers. I'm really wondering whether you even consider an Echo on Batiste here. Even though it's the CP Batiste, having the ability to double cast your Fearsome Shade actually might be really impactful in these team fights. You can just have D'Enzio chase down targets as that Fearsome Shade is having its impact. It is a bit of a waste of an item slot for a CP Batiste, though in some cases you do, after having these two items, want to go towards either a Broken Myth or some defensive itemization. So it's something that's maybe further down the road, but if you could consider this as your fifth item that isn't your boots, maybe something worth talking about. See so if he does want to go down that route. He has got Shatter Glass and the Clockwork. So he wants to get that massive amount of Crystal Power. The NTO, though, hang on a second. Wafer is going to come out, overstepping a little bit too much. That was just striking down Immortals. What is going on? This is not the Immortal we've, we've seen in the last couple of games, and Hammer's actually now taking advantage of the misstep. Maybe we should rephrase that. That's not the Hammers that we've seen in these last two games. Hammer's now really starting to make use of their, you know, compositional advantage, the ability to pick out a target so easily. Reflex blocks have to be, you know, considered pretty heavily for uh, for these members of um, Immortals right now. T-Tigers has only just picked up his. Max Green doesn't have a Crucible, so it comes down to the carries to make good use of these abilities. You also got to remember that Samuel possesses one of those abilities that demands, in some cases, a Crucible. He's got the Oblivion. It's a team-wide impact ability where if you don't have a Crucible, it can have a devastating effect on a team fight. And Max Green is choosing to prioritize an Echo over the, um, the Crucible here, meaning that he's looking for single target damage reduction and sustaining these fights over the uh, protection of the team-wide impact. Well, there's the Benediction straight on the top of starting all over, taking a fair bit of damage. They're going to fight back with that. Madison Verdict. Living comes out, it's going to get blocked from T-Tigers. One shot, one kill, not fighting as much. That massive heal as well, that intervention is going to come through from Max Green. No casualties of war just yet. Hammer's just happy to trade those cooldowns. It's very difficult for Immortals to stick to a target and blow them up easily. They don't really have a composition, especially at this stage of the game, that can run a target down and kill them in a matter of seconds. And against a weapon power Kestrel, against a Samuel, that's very important because the kiting potential of a, of a Samuel and a weapon power Kestrel is very high. So if Immortals make the engage and they don't get a kill from it, suddenly uh, they are left in no man's land with hammers having all the cannons. It's so difficult for Immortals to then, once they've used that Grace Benediction, to actually do anything off the back of it. If they don't get a kill, they're left sort of almost standing in water, ready to be fired down by, by the Hammers roster. And Hammers doing a really good job with that because they're able to disengage. They're able to then turn things around, slow the pace of the fights with this Frostbird on the Samuel, and then start to fire down Immortals once they've lost that gap closing potential. Playboy Afro and Archaic, first time on stage. Now maybe their nerves are disappearing. They're getting into their element. They're getting into the game. They're ready to take it to Immortals and show why they deserve to be here to fight for the NA's pride and just their pride of their roster as well. I mean, look at the builds coming out through for Archaic and Playboy Afro right now. Just full, all in engage, just wanting out on top of TSDA, just wanting out on top of T-Tigers. It's working out wonderful. It's actually almost the other way around with the disengage they've got. This War Treads it is a disengage tool because when, because Hammers, uh, Immortals don't really have another game plan other than let's run them down. Like we've got a Grace, we've got D'Enzio on this Vox, we're going to try and run them down as much as possible. They could potentially look for a counter engage when Hammers tried to pull the trigger, but this War Treads is to get starting all over and Archaic out of the Holy Nova, out of getting locked up by this Grace so that you can reset, then start on your own engage on your terms once the Immortals roster has lost that gap closing. Because once um, Max Green gets left for dead, once he's casting that Holy Nova, Hammers reset. They start firing down with this um, 
this composition that they've got. And then and there's nothing left in the tank for the Immortals roster. Now they want to go look for another engage. Dienzio stunned up, has to go back. Fearsome Shake came out a little bit too late and he ends up falling already. Playboy Afro trying to chase T Tigers, but that divine intervention will heal him up. And now Hammers once again snuffing out Dienzio. He's z four deaths now. This is more than he's had in the entire series. In fact, he's in the entire series before this game, he's had four deaths now doubling that. He's 0-4, zero, zero impact in the game. Hammers are coming online. Dienzi has gone for a bone sword despite there being not a single arm item picked up for Christmas. anybody on the Hammers roster. This is like investing. I, I always feel like bone sword when there is no armor is like investing in stock. You're, you're investing now for a payout later in the sense that you, you are predicting that armor might be prioritized at some point. But let's be, let's be real, Starting's not gonna pick up armor. He's a four he's a four weapon power item. Maybe Archaic will, but that's definitely down the line for him. He's not even got his Aegis or even Harvest sorted. So it's interesting to me that Dienzio wants to pick this up now. Maybe just feeling that the, the flat DPS, even against base armor, might be worth it. But I, I potentially would have liked to have seen a, um, um, a breaking point instead. Well, perhaps he'll go that next time, I mean. Still working towards a couple more defensive items, it seems. Now, Hammers, they have got major vision control over this Kraken. One thing that the Bone Sword does do is that, remember, when T-Tigers gets empowered with his souls, he does get a weapon power bonus. So you can start to hit those targets even as a CP um, Batista a little bit harder. Hammers going in, though. Wartrope's going to get popped Playboy Afro. Believe he comes through, but it's not going to hit anybody. Dien Du again, killed up by that divine intervention, but still on the front line, gets cut down. Wolf one trade. Max Green now gets That's a beautiful a Holy Nova. T-Tigers takes him out. Max Green chasing Playboy Afro away, almost sub 100 HP. Holy Nova, Max Green, MVP of that fight. They need to find this for the ace, but I'm not sure they're going to be able to get it. They might just settle for a turret. I think turret should be on the cards. They absolutely need at least one here, and Immortals find a fight. I really like the way that Dienzio decided to play this this time. Again, he gets afterburned. Ideally, he wouldn't have wanted to be afterburned, but he chases starting all over down. Instead of backing off because he got thrown into the enemy line, he says, I'm here now. I might as well do the most damage that I can. He runs play, uh, starting all over down. And once starting all over is dead, the actual close quarter damage output from Hammers is kind of neutered. And that then allows T-Tigers, who is better in these close quarter engages, to go to town on this Batiste. So I like the way that uh, Immortals changed their game plan. Realistically, though, Dienzio is going to want to start reflex blocking those afterburns. Needs to make sure he's not getting positioned like that, because that was a rare occurrence, I feel, for Hammers. That won't happen too often. You won't be gifted those kind of fights uh, as easily. They're looking for Max Green now, though. Max Green doesn't block that one at all. Knows he's got his teammates there. Will Treads use for the disengage this time? Yeah, did use the um, Crucible for the silence from Vox here, which means the Fearsome Shade is ready to go for Immortals if they can get it into position. But with uh, Max Green being so low, just wants to reset and head over to base. Looks like Cracker being started up here. When Power Kestrel can take this very quickly, Vision Control superior for Hammers. Immortals are going to have to respond now. Yeah, they respond. They're actually just stepping over Scout Traps. This might just lead it going straight over to Hammers. They're just walking on Scout Trap after Scout Trap. It falls before they can even touch it. Are they going to find the fight, though? Hammers just looking happily to take this one. But do they want to do that? That's the kind of question. Ordain's going to come out. Label Afro in the center of it all. Fearsome Shade to scare away Archaic. And they are. Very, very healthy, health bar front. Starting all over, has to move his way back, but Playboy Afro in the front line does end up getting taken out. Another Divine Intervention comes through, now starting all over in the front line. Drifting Dark comes through for IK, but he's well in the back line. Oh, in fact, they just end up trading. 1v3 ends up getting a one piece. IK backing off. Oh, what was that damage? Broken mid T Tiger, nine broken mid stacks, 730 on the mat of the Mad Mojo there. And now they're gonna be able to take down this Kraken. Should get maybe one turret here. It's, it's pretty good to take down a, a Kraken when you're Batiste. Those empowered Mad Mojos do do some serious damage, but Kraken should get at least one turret for the Hammers roster. Dienzio should respawn and should be able to clear up. Mad Mojo indeed. Instead of Mad Mojo. Aha. Oh, British jokes are always funny. Maybe to British people. I didn't laugh. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, who isn't laughing right now on Immortals as they're losing at their base? They do manage to take the Kraken. The Hammers, 40,000 gold in their pockets. Only 1,000 gold need. Had 4,000 gold in at 13 minutes. Losing it now. But thing is, Immortals, they haven't got too much left on the field. 
I like what uh, Playboy Afro has done here with the Echo, by the way. Echo onto a very short cooldown ability like Afterburn means you're going to get multiple Afterburns, maybe even multiple Echoes off over the course of a long team fight. You know, realistically, you could say that Hammers might even be able to get four or five Afterburns off just with this Echo over a sort of 30 second or so team fight. I really like this pickup for Playboy Afro. It means he can peel more effectively, isolate more effectively, and it makes the uh, kiting potential of the Hammers roster that much more impressive. Echo was buffed on this patch as well, no surprise we are seeing it once more. Massive stun actually, active camera's done on the match green, has to extra fight instantly. Fearsome Shade's gonna scare away our peg and now starting the to 1v2. Oblivion's gonna come through, but Ziendio dodges out. They find the kill, he's gonna get healed up as well, and now Hammer they are losing the last couple of fights, but Archaic, hang on a second, you've just been left almost dead alone there. Playboy Afro did use the, did get the recall off, but it's going to join him again. Now, Immortals looking to press on. They've started to rejuvenate some of that imp impressive play that we saw from them in the first two games. They don't want to let this go to a four. Dienzio's picked up his full build. Almost going to finish up that Aegis, I suppose, and also the boots, but the armor is now there, and again, Against something like a Weapon Power Kestrel, the armor is so important. That's why Max Green went for a, a Metal Jacket as second item, because it allowed him to body block and survive these Glimmer Shot hits more effectively. It's very good against Critical Strike, because you, again, have a massive reduction in the Critical Strike damage that you take as well. Starting all over has gone a bit more of a, a mediated Weapon Power Kestrel build here. Some Weapon Power Kestrels uh, chose to go for the Tension Bow with a double crit, but with the Tension Bow nerf, this feels like the best Weapon Power Kestrel build you can get. Gives you that longevity of the breaking point as well. Immortals gearing up for a push here. That range advantage from Hammers is being used ever so slightly. Benediction's going to get a slow. Playboy Afro going in. Rather aggressive. Couldn't find anything on Dientio. Actually just shoves him back towards his own team. Did pop the Echo, mind you. So did have that available again very, very shortly. Well, Dane comes out. Playboy Afro wants to get the target of that one. Oblivion's going to come through. He's actually in the sleep. One of the Dientio. Look at where he is over the wall. They lose one already, but there's Playboy Afro going straight in. Team target. He manages to fear one, but he ends up falling regardless of the fact. And now is going to get repositioned again. Can't even trade up a kill. Ace for Hammers. And now they're going to walk down the lane towards the base. 40 second death timers. This could be it. Yeah, positioning from Immortals a little bit all over the place there. Dienzio not quite able to join his team and then looks like Hammers are going to run this down to try and take this third game in the series, making a comeback, looking for that reverse sweep and Immortals, they're not going to get a clean 3-0 here. Oh no, they won't. One that turret falls, the next one that's soon to follow. Hammers fighting back against Immortals. They take game number three. It took them a little while to get online in this game, but they found the advantages of their composition eventually. Had the ability to take down that first turret, were utilizing that superior range in lane. And every single time, isolating key targets in these fights, bursting them down with this weapon power Kestrel build. And again, it's a little bit of a throw from Immortals in that last fight as well. Positioning wasn't quite what it needed to be. See if they can reset, head into this next game. Hammers making a comeback. Game number four, still on match point though, no, Immortals are. So we'll have to wait and see. Can they do it? This is the thing. I, I mentioned maybe the nerves were getting to the Hammers roster, but right now they're looking like they're stepping up their game. We're going to throw it to Analyst though. They're going to break down that Hammers win right now. The Hollywood Hammers have done it. They've pulled themselves back into this series. Honestly, off the back of game two, I wasn't sure it was going to happen, but the Hammers have clung on. Maybe it's the fact that we're in LA just around the <laughs> corner from their home, but they've managed to pull the magic out. Yeah, making sure that we do not have a single 3-0 series to start this Unified Live Championship. We've said it before, we'll say it again. This has been the most competitive that professional vainglory has ever yeah. been. I mean, even just th this series alone <laughs> feels like that right now. I mean, Sweet Jay, talk me through kind of what happened here, because this was the first time we've seen Hammers really taking charge in that early game and starting the game off strong. Yeah, this is why we see Kestro being banned away, because starting is able to play it so well. And with the active count, he's just dodging and just playing around um, Immortals here. And they did such a good job in the early game and making sure that they're able to get a first turret in a 3v2 lane push. You know, starting actually in Fuse early as well. 
Um, and they actually caught Immortals out too at the nine minute mark and just slowly got a nice lead. And Immortals came back with a like few, like two good fights. Mm -hmm. And then the last fight is what decided the match there. Yeah, it was like the Hammer started off strong, Immortals then started to even things up. And we have a few more replays of kind of the mid game and towards the late game where we started to see Immortals kind of get back on the horse, get back into the game, make things competitive again. But then once it got to the very late stages of the game, Hammers, they seem to just they seem to figure out how to play these team fights. Yeah, and again, mental fortitude is so strong for both of these teams to be able to go down as heavily as did. I mean, Hammers, it looked like coming into this that they were not gonna be able to you know, have another game. And then they start, came out so strong, once it started to get turned around, once Immortals were able to find these fights, D'Enzio able to just trade himself. When he went down, he was at least taking someone with him. Immortals start coming back in this one. It's so easy to be, oh, we're down 2-0. They're starting to come back. This is it. We can't actually beat them. But they were able to stick to their guns and somehow found a way to claw back into this one again. Yeah, and I feel like there's a lot of times where, you know, although starting is a hyper carry and they're, they're doing a good job focusing him, they could have just focused... Um, Okay. Archaic, because Samuel oh. does not have that much defense, and he can't active camo and disappear. So something that I thought had happened when that we saw that fight live, and seeing it now in the replay, it can confirm it. D'Enzio tried to use the sonic zoom over the wall, did not get over the wall, and it kept him from being able to be as heavily involved in that fight as he would have liked to have been. Yeah, and unfortunately, when that, that kind of tiny little mechanical misplay happens, that can lose you a fight. And, then Hammers managed to finish things off just there. It wasn't the longest death timers in the world. It was only 21 minutes into the game, but it's long enough when all three members are alive and Hammers managed to take that one, managed to get themselves back into the series. And I feel like that is going to be a huge morale boost for this team. I've, off the back of that second game, they must have been kind of a, a little bit down in the dumps because it was not a pretty game for them in game number two, but that is definitely going to be something that kind of raises the hopes of the squad once again. This also shows, you know, going back to the draft of the Adagio ban, sometimes you do have to go away from the meta when it comes to your ban phase to take away something that is just giving your opponents the momentum. If you can't find a way to beat that Adagio, you ban it away and just try and figure out a way to deal with what is those strong meta picks. Hammers were able to make it work here. You know, because you got to figure if the Adagio goes through, they're beaten mentally. They don't know how to take care of it. And D'Enzio has just been playing so phenomenally out of that. It's going to give him extra confidence if he's able to get onto it. So even though it's not a meta pick necessarily right now, banning it away from someone who is hot with it is the right choice to make. Yeah, and I think right now the weakness is they're overly focusing on starting. Their Afro is out of position sometimes, and Archaic's out of position. They need to just focus the front line sometimes and just focus, because with Bonesaw and the damage coming from Batiste, Samuel can, will just explode, and Kestrel can escape. So I feel like sometimes they overly focus on starting, which wins them some of the key fights, but sometimes it's not. Oh. <laughs> Look at Poli go Look there. At that. I mean, he's the best dressed uh, analyst, you know. I, I can't, <laughs> can't compete is. with that. I can't. He, he's looking great on stage and dropping a cheeky little bit of BM. While 2 1 down, looking towards a reverse sweep, right? That, uh, that's that's <laughs> confidence right there coming out. But uh, we should be looking towards the draft here in game number four. We'll see whether Immortals can finish things off or whether Hammers are going to push this to the full five game series immediately. Hammers once again banning away that. Adagio, they are done with D'Enzio's Adagio. <laughs> yeah, Kestrel gonna get taken off the board as well. Hammer's not going to allow T-Tigers to have that glaive either. So they have to be very happy with the way this draft has started. They've taken away two of the strongest picks for Immortals thus far today. Yeah, absolutely. That glaive certainly has been an influential pick, but Krull, I would say equally influential across the course of today. Yeah, and a uh, glaive pick is really good because Immortals shown that they can play Glaive for the row, and also Hammers have shown that they're really, really, like Afro's Glaive is actually really solid with the Afterburns that he's able to help set starting up for. So Crow is picked here, and then now they have to decide to ban between Grace, Calf, or Batiste. So it looks like they're going to take away that Grace. And Hammers will probably ban away the, the Calf and not give like a double stun combo uh, for the side of Immortals here. Uh, so with Grace off the board, We'll see is if Lyra is going to be a choice here just to take the healers away entirely or if that will end up being an option that is available. If you give a, a healer over with a crawl, the sustain can just be absolutely oppressive. It's so difficult, especially with the glaive already selected. You know, you don't really have 
too many other options for getting mortal wounds onto that crawl to try and slow him down. We have already seen Fortress for Mortal Wounds used a couple of times across the course of today. That's something that could come into this series again, but it, we'll have to see how this draft is going to continue oh, to pan wow. out. Idris, Idris is banned instead. So at least Lyra and Cap open. But if they pick Cap and Crow, that's actually really good into a Lyra because the CC and ability to lock someone down it can really help Immortals, you know, lock down either even Lyra or Glaive here. Because Glaive is actually risky into a Crow because Crow actually counters a, a lane Glaive, for example. And you see there, Max Green has played a whole bunch of Lyra over the course of the regular season. It is his most played here, obviously. You know, they had only a couple of weeks in the Vainglory 8 but it is the most played hero for him with five games out of their 16 total. So uh, it's definitely a pick that they'd like to go for if, you know, at least on the previous updates, maybe not so much here on 2.7. Yeah, Cath is a great pick because if they don't take Cath here, Hammers will probably run one of their comps that they love running is Celeste, Glaive, Cath. Triple CC, those are the comps that they excel with. So taking Cat here is really smart. Now Immortals has actually double CC now from from with Crow and Cat. So I think Hammers here will probably opt to take the Celeste, which is super risky because you have Crow and Cat, and they're both really really solid into a Celeste. So they might go for a Samuel actually, and then just play a uh, Captain Glaive again because Weapon Glaive is not really solid. And Archaic has actually played the Samuel really well. So we we'll probably go for a Jungle Samuel here and get Frostburn so that he can minimize. Oh, 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 oh Ringo oh, is going to be picked up here. Now this, this is, is interesting. CP Ringo potentially. I was going to say because we've seen starting play that Weapon Power Ringo in one v three with it. That's definitely something that could be on the cards. But CP Ringo has been creeping into the meta recently. Yeah, it's definitely something that they're going to have to keep in mind uh, for Immortals when they make their last select selection. We'll get a better idea based on what this last pick is. Actually, maybe we will yeah, because we don't it's get a, a sky. Idea. <laughs> and so, you know, we've seen CP Ringo in, you know, East Asia. We've seen Weapon Sky in East Asia. We've seen Weapon Sky here today not do very well into the Celeste. And there is going to be a Celeste picked up. So even though the sky is usually picked supposed to be a counter to the Celeste. We have not seen it do well today, and Immortals confident enough in the pick to go with it into what is supposed to be the counter. Yeah, they're going to go CP Sky here, and a weapon, Ringo, uh, it could, could be really risky. They have to get a really good afterburn here and get either, it means Celeste. They just need to get Celeste, because afterburn and Crow may not be the best option, because he wants to get on top of your carries, so they need to somehow figure out how to get close to the Celeste here. And Ringo, once Cat or Crow is on top of him, He's not going to be able to, yep. he's going to be really immobile and stunned. This, this was starting all over in the regular season. You can see it on your screens. This is what happens when starting all over has, uh, has Ringo a need of vengeance right here. This was against Gangstars and managed to save the game for himself. Yeah, incredible play. We know that he has a phenomenal Ringo. The previous season before that, uh, in the spring season, he absolutely destroyed all season long with weapon power Ringo to the point where people were wondering if he could even play any other hero because that's how frequently and how strong he was with that pick. So uh, definitely a comfort pick for starting all over and why not go for the comfort pick when you're in this situation, you're back against the wall, you just got your first win, yep. you still need to get two more, go for those comfort picks. We do have to mention as well though, Sky has been locked in and we have seen more and more weapon Sky going towards the lane. So that could be something that's starting is heading on and we'll see the Ringo in CP in the jungle. We'll have to wait and see, it's time to get into game four, ladies and gentlemen. I want to hear you make some noise as we pass it back to the casters and get on into game. Thank you very much, guys. Jules and Excalibur once again back at it. And here we are, Hammers, they're fighting back, fighting for their lives. And day number two is on the horizon for both of these teams. But can Immortals close it out or will Hammers continue their streak? Now this is a very, very risky Ringo pick. If it is indeed going to starting, which it does look like that's going to be the case, it is very, very risky to pick a Ringo into a Cruel and Catherine. You have to be so good with your reflex blocks, you have to be so good with your positioning. And Zio will scale up very nicely here. Remember, this is the sky that has been updated. It's more about locking on and getting that single target damage. If you can find the dive into the back line, Onto the Celeste, you can blow her up quite readily in the late game, but no longer can you just forward barrage from range and get away with it. Mortal's already being very aggressive. Playboy Afro forced to back out, although D'Enzio really wants to be able to take this Elder Tree in the front line. So it's not like actually he does manage to secure it, so Playboy Afro not managing to secure that for his team. Starting all over, just happy to farm the lane out, however. Just looking to put pressure here. Starting all over, punishing 
Dienzio from taking a very risky way back into the lane. Fly in the Afro now, trying to apply pressure with starting, who's going to look to push this wave as quickly as possible. They have allowed Cruel his free jungle, though. He has now hit level two. He's going to start running in. Yeah, Playboy Afro is going to have to back out, but a reposition onto T-Tigers might prove worse than where. He does manage to use those boosts to get away. Oh, Playboy Afro with oh, that basic attack. There we, go. there we go. First blood to Dienzio, but RK does trade it up. T-Tigers is going to fall. Double He's just kill. fighting back, but a double kill for Dienzio. I don't think it's a triple one, unless he can find a miracle. Oh, Starting all over, tickles Dienzio on the way out, but he ends up surviving. Remember, this is where Sky has got a lot lower early game damage, but scales up on a single target basis a lot higher. So if you can get that lock on, and remember, Sky, if she picks up something like a Frostburn, can kite very readily against Max Green, can kite very readily against T Tigers on this Cruel and Catherine. And the single target should the game go on. That, that might be it oh, for starting. Heliogenesis, core collapse, all of the above. And portals find another kill. And that'll be three on the board already. Very reminiscent of game number one for Immortals. See, Tiger's got his uh, forward healing camp stolen away. Played by Afro gets some delayed revenge as Archaic starts to farm up in this jungle. Three crystal bits. This is how we used to see Sky build before the rush of the Frostburn became the thing. The more CP you get on Sky, the easier it is to get that enhanced lock-on damage. She scales very well with CP on a single target basis now. But it's a lot harder to play and a lot harder to position with her. But she will combo very well with the Glaive specifically. Because the one thing that Sky struggled with lock-ons as a CP build is that it's very hard to get into range to lock-on because it has to be your basic attack range. Glaive is going to help her find those single targets. Under the core collapse, straight after the Merciless Pursuit, T Tigers chases starting all over underneath the turrets. Dienzio falls down though as Playboy Afro does secure the kill, and amongst all that mayhem, okay, it's going to join them as well. Only level four. Nothing really too much under his belt rather than through crystal bits. It's actually going to be facing Archaic. We'll get the healing oh, here. Wait oh, a Max Green maybe looking for the solo kill. Burning him with the Storm Shield. Can he get him starting all over? Running away. Mercer's Pursuit on cooldown still. Shield available soon as well. Oh, is he going to go for him? Tags him. He's got the shield. He's going to burn him away. Starting on over falls. Max Green finds the solo kill. Dienzio getting chased oh. out by Archaic. The four barrage was good. Ends up falling down, and now T-Tigers in a 1v2 for Barrage again. The lock on is just too much. Archaic does even the score line up, four and four. Although Max Green may be looking for a vengeance here. Archaic starting to scale up on this uh, oh. sky. The Afterburn oh. should get played by Afro away. Oh, there yeah, we go, yeah. yeah. The Afterburn is going to get him away, but Max Green pushing very hard to be the carry this game at 1-0-3. Dienzio is starting to fall behind on farm. Not a huge amount though, and has got a way pushing his way, so he'll be able to even things up here. But a very explosive game right now. Archaic starting to accelerate ahead. Wondering if he's going to go for a Shatterglass or a Frostburn. You feel against the Cruel and the Catherine, Frostburn might be better. But that does delay the certain breakpoint of CP that Sky needs to start out damaging her old build. And be very interested to see where Archaic invests this gold. Looks like it's going to be towards, well, again, definitely either a Frostburn or a Shatterglass. But again, I just think Frostburn is so good against this composition from Immortals that you kind of need it. Speaking of Frostburns, Frostburns, Dienzio picks up one for himself. Now, where is their power spike? Where do these timers lie? Where do they need to come online? Where, what, what kind of minute mark or item spike? Because Max Green, we, we've seen this Catherine kind of pick ban throughout the tournament, but it's only just really in a Max Green's hands now who is looking to go towards that Echo fairly early on. Yeah, Echo provides such ridiculous team fight control. If you Echo Catherine's ultimate, you get you know almost a combined time of five seconds silence. So even if you block the first one, you're going to get silence on the second hand of things. And silencing up someone like a Sky who relies on her Siri Strike and her forward barrage for mobility and damage, it's pretty important for the likes of Cruel and Catherine who can then look to lock down on a stun. Starting all over here. Speaking of locking down, very fast fingers on the reflex block. Was able to block out the Mercer's pursuit. Although well, T-Tiger's looking on the side, does have from Hell's Heart, it's actually going to find it, Core Collapse is going to land him on as well, Dienzio pumping out the damage, Death from up, also rains down, okay, not finding anybody, but it doesn't matter, because starting all over is alive, they do manage to save him for the moment, and now Immortals, they need to maybe find this re-engage, there's blinking health bars, but starting all over is going to get a free base. Nice collapse onto starting all over there, pinpointed out by T-Tiger's ultimate, who's working towards a tension bow himself, delayed tension bow though, 
Ideally, we'd like that as quickly as possible. We're heading towards the six minute mark, so it's a little bit later than you might think. Actually, oh, get isolated. he tried to shot for it. He did actually buy it in the end, gets isolated, but he's going to be able to back off. Not too much of an issue. So looking for that burst potential versus the double squishy here. Again, combine that with the burst of Catherine's Heliogenesis, and you have the ability to take out one of these low health targets in the form of the Ringo in the sky very quickly. But again, it's all about whether you can get on top of them. Once Archaic maybe picks up that Frostburn, it might be harder and harder to do so. It's picked up a Reflex Block, though. I love the prioritization of Reflex Blocks here. The chain stuns from the Immortals roster do mean that you need the ability to be able to block those out. And he does pick up that Frostburn. So suddenly things looking good for Hammers in terms of their ability to cope with that engage from the Immortals roster. Suddenly, it's going to be a lot harder for them to chase down and force their engages onto these targets. Cool. Go back and forth, Max Green. He's going to have to be quite careful. Playboy Afro is waiting in the wings. is not level 6 at the moment either. A Solar Storm is going to be fairly impactful. Like you just said, the, the layering of CC has already been quite apparent. Just hit 6 now. Here comes the Hellfire Brute. Bada bing, bada blocked. Mortal's going to be able to block that one and be able to walk away. T-Tigers again with the Hellfire. I was going to say Hellfire Brute, it's not the one. It's been a long day. Played by Afro now, searching for a position. Here comes the run-in by Max Green. This pursuit actually finds the stun. There comes the silence. Another stun comes through. He's not going to be able to do anything at this There's point. The burst. Solar Storm, the burst comes out. The core collapse onto two people, but still able to survive that death from above surrounding Immortals. They were able to get stunned up from Hell's Heart used as well. So a lot of big cooldowns now now for Immortals. Doesn't mean to say they're deterred at all, just focusing on this turret. Cool Collapse does go a little bit wide, but that smite is going to be pretty big. The healing comes out. Fountain as well, used onto the NZO to keep him alive. A good defense here by Hammers. A good push onto that first turret, though, for Immortals. If they could do that once more, that should go down. Now, some of you might be wondering why Sky specifically is pretty good into the likes of Catherine and Cruel, especially when you've got that um, Frostburn off. Obviously, two heroes that rely solely on their ability to run at you very quickly. Slowing them down with the Frostburn means that it makes it a lot harder for them. It means they can't find those opportunities to engage. But more specifically, when looking at actual damage output, Storm Shield is one of Catherine's main defensive abilities. It blocks damage greater than 10% of her current or her max HP. Sky's individual ticks of her forward barrage are always lower than that threshold. So you can get the full damage without reflecting damage from uh, Catherine's Storm Shield when using Sky's forward barrage on Catherine. So it means that Catherine isn't quite as tanky as she usually is in that front line because she's not blocking that main form of damage output from the Sky. Now the Siege from Hammers really working out well. Whoa. Playboy Afro dashes in. There's the afterburn onto Max Green. T Tigers now hunting it down from Hell's Heart. It's going to get blocked. Beautiful use of the Crucible there coming through from Playboy Afro. Right on point. Oh, Max Green. Starting actually used his reflex block as well. So that's a big move for him because now he has no way to stop the Ooh, Blast Tremor used to try and stop the back there of Starling all over. He does manage to get away, however. Echo being a second item for Max Green. Still got that available. So. Well, the Blast Tremor, that is. So one thing that Archaic does have here is the pure mobility that Sky has, her locked-on movement speed and her Suri Strike, is going to make it very difficult for Dienzio to find the correct positioning for the Heliogenesis. Someone as mobile as Sky means that she's able to negotiate her way around those Superdome. It's a good push here onto the first turret here. Big cooldowns aren't still available. Death and Rub does come through. Max Green actually just in the front line. Blast Tremor isn't going to actually connect to the ground. Core Collapse misses as well. Starting all over in the front line, however. Does have to end up backing off. T-Tigers doing a little bit too much damage. Hellfire Brew isn't going to get blocked. DNZO just tanks that one up. Has got even Harvest for the regeneration, so it's not too much of an issue. T-Tigers still chasing, though. Has got that turret to back him off to it. Four Bright doing a lot of damage. Look at that from Hell's oh, Heart. And she collapses him. Heliogenesis and the last attack will shut down Playboy. Afro. Oh, the capitalization by Dienzio was quick, but what a what a clutch play from T Tigers to use that on the back out. They're oh, actually gonna catch start collapse. Again. That was wrong place, wrong time. Max Green's there as well. Gets stunned up. Another kill for Dienzio. Now this is looking like game one and two, Dienzio. Six and two on this Kestrel. Look at Dienzio's build path. He's gone for the three items, but hasn't gone for a broken myth. He has prioritized a clockwork over that item instead. That's very interesting. That, to me, says that he knows it is crucial that he's landing core collapses and heliogenesis, especially onto someone as mobile as Sky. So by reducing the, uh, the cooldown of the heliogenesis, it means you're more likely to place it in an area that Sky is while her Suri Strike is on cooldown. 
Loves the ability to be able to spam from range as well. The, the energy regeneration in this build, as well as the range that he now has at level 8, means he's going to outrange hammers for the most part. That's exactly where they want to keep him, at range. Look at this, it's like a minefield. They have to negotiate so carefully around this heliogenesis. Look at the damage as well coming out. It's untouchable right now for the NTO. Oh, from Eltar does that. Call Collapse is going to land too, although the Surrey Strike back was almost good. He ends up falling anyway. Dientio just chasing up to the turret. He wants a little bit of starting. As starting's going very low, he uses that reflex block for the shield, but it doesn't matter in the end. Dientio finds it. Playboy Afro running away. Don't Another Helio Jensen oh. will finish him off. Dientio's on fire. Ace comes through for Immortals, and the base is going to get cracked. Dientio with this build, able to spam those Helio Genesis, and he's showing why he has always been one of the reigning laners in the North American scene. Take a look at this. The minefield gets set up, Dienzio spamming those Heliogenesis, Archaic oversteps, doesn't block, Chain CC comes down, and that's good night skies. The follow-up is so, so strong from Immortals. Dienzio with the Frostburn, his basic attacks are going to slow as well, because they do deal crystal damage. And he's able to just chase down the remainder of the Hammers roster. Dienzio looking very, very strong on this carry. Nice guys, well, they'll be looking at this evening if they do end up falling. That's oh, hammers oh, that is. What a catch on starting. Well, over still manages to make it out alive. However, there's the fountain trying to kite back. But Matt Screen's hot on his tail. DNG gets stunned up from the death from above. The starting low is still going to go down. T Tigers finds the kill. He will just duck into that brush. And oh dear, wrong place, wrong time. Arcane can't kite back quick enough. Another kill for Dienzio. And now. Immortals clearing up game number four. You can't out-mobility her, Celeste, if she's spamming a slowing star every 1.5 seconds or so. Absolute crushing power on this Celeste. Now she's got these items behind her. Gonna get the turret. They might sacrifice T-Tigers for it. Yeah, He's do. quite happy to do so. Yep. She's gonna sacrifice himself. So I had a fair bit wilder. Ooh, that smite was close. Not quite hitting the mark though, starting over. If he went down there, that would have been a little bit, a little bit tilting. But regardless of the fact, four items now completed for Dienzio. Broken Myth Online. This guy's hitting like a metaphorical truck. And you can see the range that Dienzio has had has allowed him to build damage from range. Now that's going to be sort of amplified with the use of this Broken Myth as well. Everything on the... Oh, oh the Duke. Core Collapse as well is going to find the oh, stun. Just Look gone. at that damage. Deleted. Off the face of the fold, Max Green kind of back oh. there comes the damage again. What is going on? Solar Storm right in the behind of Playboy Afro. Dienzio triple chasing, kill. triple kill. Ace. Ace, he is unstoppable. 12 2 and 2. This is the Dienzio we know at lives. I was almost getting up because the game felt like it was very close to being over there, but they're going to just clear out the Hammer's jungle. They're going to head towards Crystal the gold defeated. miner that is being taken by T-Tigers. Everything now on the Immortals roster is to facilitate Dienzio's ability to carry in these fights. You've got the Chain CC coming out from this double echo on the silence. You've also got the ability to lock down the target that T-Tigers has. You also have the War Treads now, gives him the ability to chase down and what could Hammers do at this point to bring themselves back in? It feels like they have to dive this Celeste somehow, but the range and the control that Immortals are bringing are making it fight very, very hard. From Hell's Heart does end up landing on the rebound. Does go straight on top of one. Oh my goodness, what is this damage? Starting all over on the run. Hasn't even picked up his first kill of the game. Nice use of the afterburn to get the distance. This is starting all over. It's Ringo we are talking about, and it is 0-7 on the board. <laughs> Immortals, they're looking to take Kraken now. Hey, this is uh, Zio Celeste we're talking about, mate. This uh, guy has been playing an incredible series thus far. You know, there was a point where it felt like Zio was starting to lose the ability to sort of have his motivation towards the game, but he's certainly found it over the last few months. Has come back and has been proving that he's still one of the best laners in North America. Right, Here we go. Very low. Gonna get the steal, possibly. Nope, it's gonna get stolen away by Helio Gensels, or secured, I should say. They don't give up their lives, but they give up the Kraken. And now Hammers, they are on the back foot. They need to be able to react now. What can Hammers do, though? The only way that they have of pressuring this Immortal's composition is that they somehow find an afterburn. Onto Dienzio, putting him right in that fiery line of starting all over. Starting all over does not have any burst in his kit yet. He's li literally on a lucky strike. They need to be able to get him into range of this uh, lock-on for Archaic, and they need to be able to burst Zio. If they don't do that, 
they're not going to win these fights. But Zio feels almost untouchable because he's so far away positioned and got so much CC to help him kite. They're just going to be looking to run this down and get that win. 50 CS and 13 kills over his counterpart. L5 Rue does land, it's gonna get blocked. Nice use the reflex box from Styling all over to block that from Hell's Heart. Kraken still knocking on the base doors. There comes the core collapse, the blast tremor as well, it's gonna follow. They're just buying time now for this Kraken. It's taking a fair bit of damage, but so is that turret. Look at those Heliogenses rain through Arcade. Fountain use, and now but they just wanna end. Immortals, they just wanna finish this crystal off. This Kraken knocking down. Playboy Astro's gonna fall. Triple kill once more for Dientio, the ace, and we will see you in day two. A blip in the road for Immortals, but a very convincing series win over Hammers. Zio on this Celeste, I love the itemization choices that he made. He knew the cooldown reduction, the ability to find those slows of the Heliogenes onto a very mobile sky was incredibly important, more so than building broken mid stacks. And once he had that online, even Sky's mobility was unable to escape those rain of stars that came down. Hammers, they played a, a pretty solid series, that third game especially. They found their way back into it, but Immortals just looked the stronger team. Immortals looked like that strength roster that we know that they have in terms of individual talent. And I actually genuinely think they are real contenders here. Europe will be looking at this Immortals roster saying, goodness me, I'm, I'm genuinely scared for what they can bring to the table. They should be. Seems like they can play anything. Dientio, the man on your screen right now, pretty chuffed with himself. But to break down that series a little bit more, we're going to jump onto Joe on the desk. Thank you very much, guys. That is going to be Immortals taking the series 3-1 in the end. And I was just saying to Denomine off stage there, I, even though it was a 3-1 scoreline in the end, that was a 3-2 in my heart because of how <laughs> close these games were. Like, I don't feel like that scoreline truly represents how close these two teams are. Yeah, that was an incredible series. Both teams fought so well, but in the end, Immortals and Dienzio especially, yeah. able to just really overpower Hammers and at the end. You know, that game, Dienzio had five tier three items when the game ended. Starting all over had two. Wow. That, it, it was unbelievable how much farther ahead Dienzio was able to got, get, and it was because of the team effort of focusing starting all over and making sure that he could not be a factor in this game. Yeah, and Max Green on this Catherine, oh my god. He, probably one of the best, if not the best Catherine right now, with how he plays it, and like, if you guys notice, he's using Immersive's Pursuit, he's holding the stun, Catherine can proc the sun in three seconds. So he actually baits out to reflex block so many times and lands a stun. Such beautiful play by Max Green there. And you can see um, Hammers actually had some good plays as well. You know, they were able to get a turret first. Their objective game is just really, really strong. So, so really well done by Hammers as well. But Immortals just came through with this with this comp. I mean, their, yeah. their focus in CC was just amazing. Yeah, I think one of the key things about this game is it was another one where this early game was unbelievably close. That was a beautiful <laughs> ultimate, let me just point out, coming out there. But yeah, it, this game, until we got to the later stages, really was anyone's game. And once they they got the you know, triple stun online, the crawl with the From Hell's Heart, core collapses, Merciless Pursuit, it was so difficult for the members of Hammers to get out once they got in to yeah. that CC train. It was just non-stop pressure coming from Immortals. And this is why we see Catherine being banned. A good Catherine can literally carry the entire game. Yeah, and now we have a triple kill coming up from Dienzio. And this was truly <laughs> a highlight, yeah. not only of the game, but of the series. I mean, talk me through this, This guys. is Dienzio and Max Green. Max Green actually baited out the reflex box, stunned the Ringo, and then Zio fought with the core collapse, killed him, and then killed Sky. So, like, both of them just played extremely well. The synergy, it's like it's like they can 2v3 all the time. It's amazing uh, how well these two are playing together. Yeah, absolutely. And Dienzio is going to grab himself the MVP for that. Just look. Average damage done of 37,000. <laughs> that is obscenely yeah. high, but 10 double kills yeah. and a 5 yeah. KDA. That although, is unheard of. Although Zio played for Nano and his MVP as a captain main myself, Max Green is also an MVP in this game. They're both <laughs> MVPs, honestly. Max Green played phenomenal. I mean, out of this world, honestly. Yeah, I think double MVP on that one. But uh, just exceptional play across the board. And I think. The key thing about Zero as well was how difficult he was to kill in those games. Like his KDA or his, his average KDA across the board was so unbelievably high. But we do have an interview on the stage with Dan Gaston. He's standing by with one of our winners. So let's take a look. I swear to God, I mean, 
it's not a coincidence that all the MVPs are the guys I'm interviewing. It's purely coincidental. Hello, good sir. It's lovely to see you again. I remember speaking to you back at London. You're about this high. <laughs> now you're up here. You, you're catching me up. Uh, an amazing feeling uh, to take such a, a victory over some rivals. You beat them back in London as well. What's going through your head at the moment? I'm very happy. Like, very. Like, beating Hammers, like, beating Star in, in general is the best feeling on the planet. So, I mean, like, that's as much as you can get, right? Well, that's the best feeling, but let's go back to the worst feeling on the planet then. Back at London, you were the only North American team to lose to a European team. And you're gonna be facing off against SK tomorrow. What are your thoughts? All right, so let me talk about where we lost to EU. Okay, so, you know, Sui's not a player anymore, so let's just put all the blame on him, you know? Let's just, like, just put the blame on him, okay? Uh, and you know what, going against SK, you know, I've heard that they're a really strong EU team. Uh, you know, NA over EU, so I think we should just beat them. Like, NA, man, we're NA. You heard it first. NA is where we're gonna go. Best of luck tomorrow. Get some sleep, I need some sleep, you need some sleep. Everyone needs some sleep. It's been an amazing day here. Let's find out a little bit more analysis, though, from the desk. Oh say, my god, I gotta no. take these tire marks off my back. <laughs> 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 Sweet Jay just weighing everyone down. <laughs> I know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty heavy. Here. I have to say that was a hilarious interview, D'Enzio. Beautiful stuff, but yeah. <laughs> going to be very happy with that victory. Immortals move on to tomorrow. They're going to be taking on SK Gaming. Definitely going to be an interesting one.